All right, welcome to everyone joining. We're gonna start in about two minutes here. Just gonna let people funnel in. And as you're joining, please leave in the chat where you're coming from. We always like to see the diversity of our audience. So you put what state or what city. <laughs> Arizona, Bay Area, Fort Lauderdale. Hello, Vermont. <laughs> Salt Lake City. I know that's where you were, John. <laughs> San Diego, the best place. Houston, Texas. Israel. LA. Long Island. Nice. Central California. But what part of Central California? Earth. <laughs> <laughs> the middle Kansas South Carolina awesome yeah if you're just joining we're going to start in a minute so feel free to share where you're joining from <laughs> Jason <laughs> thank you I appreciate it <laughs> Agree, great. Temecula, good wine out there. Rochester. Garen Grove, yeah, we got, got SoCal representing today. Yeah. Alabama, there we go. Alabama, Minnesota, too. Boston. Boston, great. Phoenix. Phoenix. Lodi. Well, that's about two hours away from us, huh? Yeah, I mean, it was like great. Creedence Clearwater song about it. <laughs> <laughs> Fairfax. All right, great. Yeah, keep them coming. Keep them coming. I love this. Quincy, Massachusetts, Colorado. And while people are funneling in, I'm going to go ahead and get started so we don't get too behind schedule. I, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. This is going to be a fantastic three hours. We've got three great speakers. We've got some awesome presenters, some awesome promotions as well. So let's just jump right into the announcements and jump into the program. And first thing before we kind of really jump into the gist of this, uh, we do want to mention Eye Care Solutions for your practice. So this is something that we've teamed up with CSI on. It's for medical billing, it's for compliance, credentialing, chart review and audit assistance. It's fantastic. We've got about 50 members that have already utilized this service and we want just the most to utilize it as possible because this is custom tailored for your practice. If you're a private practice owner, this is tailored to allow you to gain more revenue, be more efficient with your billing. So definitely take a look, scan that QR code right there. If medical billing or credentialing is something that you're having an issue with or something that you feel like you could do a little bit better in your practice. And this is from Julie. Uh, if you remember from two weeks ago, we had Conan Medical and they had they presented that CE program for us. Uh, that deal for the handheld ERG is still going on. So make sure to email Ian McMillan at conanmedical.com very soon. Uh, that deal is going to expire pretty soon. And it was better than the Vision Expo deal. So make sure you mention the Odie's on finance deal so you get a better discount and you get the extra box of strips. And we are super excited about the job board. And the job board is coming May 15th, so just a few weeks away. And as advertised, it's going to be $19 to list a job and $2.99 to list a practice. None of that crazy $250 fee, no consulting fees, none of that jazz. We're just going to make it simple. It's going to be the LinkedIn meets indeed of optometry. And so everyone has their unique profile. You can search jobs. It's seamless. It's integrated. And our community of 14,000 is going to be on it. So it's going to be fantastic. So just look out for that. There'll be more announcements coming. And of course, if you need to refi your student loans, we've still got some very good rates. Uh, there's a lot going on in the government regarding this. Uh, there's obviously the deferral and then rates are going up like crazy and who knows, maybe we'll hit a recession. We don't know for sure, but if you need to refi, do it now, scan the QR code before everything gets crazy. And after that, yeah, I want to pass it on to our sponsors now. So we've got some fantastic sponsors. They all relate to our program today. So you're going to find that these all intertwine and all these sponsors are here to make your practice better, to help you build revenue, to help you become more profitable. So our first sponsor today is Hiru, and this is a fantastic VR headset for visual fields and other testing as well. So I'm gonna pass it over to Mike Chen, 
who is a colleague and a fantastic OD, and he's going to talk a little bit more about Hero. Great, Aaron. Thank you. Let me just share my screen. Good morning, everybody. Um, so I am happy to be here with you guys today um, talking about Hero. Um, so Hero is a, a wearable vision diagnostic platform. Uh, we're based out of uh, Miami, uh, out of the Baskin Palmer Eye Institute. Um, and really the uh, kind of background for why we uh, started as a company was to really to um, meet the global need for, you know, the unmet need for clinical care, uh, eye care especially. Um, you know, globally there's, um, you know, rising prevalence of all these um, vision threatening diseases and especially, you know, made worse by the, the pandemic the last few years. And so there's an, a large unmet need for, um, you know, access, simple access, easy access to diagnostics to uh, help kind of detect and hopefully prevent these uh, sight threatening diseases. So uh, as I said, we're born out of the University of Miami's Baskin Palmer Eye Institute. Uh, the goal really for the company is to democratize healthcare and improve access to uh, you know, state-of-the-art, accurate, and portable technology. And so um, this is our product. We were recently honored uh, with a, CEA, a CES Innovation Award. I believe it's the only eye care company that um, received such an award. So very happy, excited about that. Um, we're a relatively new company, but we've already uh, uh, you know, expanded quite quickly and uh, just recently hit our milestone for 20,000 eyes tested in the US. And so very excited about that. Um, just to give you guys a little bit of background on, um, you know, overview of the technology, it's lightweight, portable, um, you know, because it's a headset, you can, the test can be performed really anywhere in the practice, um, especially good for uh, patients with mobility issues or elderly patients, uh, fast testing time, good repeatability. Um, we have studies that show um, very good repeatability and uh, comparability to the gold standard testing. And, um, the, one of the unique uh, things about our platform is that we are able to offer multiple diagnostic exams through the same headset. So the goal really is to keep expanding and offer more and more modalities um, using the same set of hardware. And so these are the tests that we currently offer. And like I said, we're you know, uh, rapidly expanding into different modalities as well. Um, the goal being to be able to allow you to have you know, different types of you know, support more and more CPT codes for uh, your practice to uh, earn a better ROI from the investment. Um, so again, these are some of the tests that we offer. Um, recently came out with the uh, D15 color vision test, which is a reimbursable exam. And everything's done through the headset. So um, everything, you know, all the colors are calibrated. There's no need for maintenance. Um, all the software updates are done over the air as well. So very easy um, in terms of keeping all your uh, testing modalities up to date. So here's a screenshot of our portal. Um, everything is browser-based. So um, you know, any tablet or any computer you can use to access your test results, um, you know, uh, order, appoint, uh, order testing, uh, view appointments, and access the results once the testing is done. So it makes it very portable, um, suitable for telemedicine as well. OK, so that's just a brief overview of the company. Again, happy to stay on. And if there's any questions, feel free to, um, I'll stay around for a few minutes. Feel free to put it in the chat, and I'm happy to answer it for you. Thank you. All right, awesome. Thank you, Mike. And I hear you're fantastic. And a lot of different CPT codes that you can apply to that. So definitely something to look into. And next we've got OMG. So OMG is run by the fantastic Bill Gerber. Uh, a lot of great resources here for your optical and just kind of sprucing it up. So Bill, I'm gonna let you take it over. All right, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thanks for turning out today, everybody. Sunday morning, this is awesome. I am getting to the share here and let's get it going. You got the screen good? Yep. Yeah. All right. Perfect. So um, give you a little bit of background on OMG. We founded the company about nine years ago. Uh, it's my second go around as a uh, visual merchandising uh, uh, person in the optical industry. Um, OMG designs practices and we add the OMG to the optical to the front of house 
and really to the uh, to the practice in general. Um, we took a lot of time during COVID to talk to our clients and ask them, hey, what's the effect of, you know, what's the ROI actually on practice design? Because this is, a, this is something that's been really super vague until this point. And what we found was, um, uh, it was really amazing. I mean, there was, there was a lot of subjectivity around it. Like, oh, I like coming into my practice better. Uh, my staff's happier. Patients say, wow, this looks great. I was like, well, okay, what about the dollars, right? I want to know the dollars. You know, you spend a hundred grand on a remodel or 50 grand or 20 grand, whatever the number is, and did it do anything? And uh, it was very, very interesting to hear the feedback. So I'll share a little bit of that with you. Um, capture rate in our industry, and this, this is a tragedy, especially for independents. Um, uh, 48%, so independents do 78% of the exams, but only sell 48% of the goods, which concurs directly with the capture rate. So 48% on average, uh, our clients are experiencing 69% on average, sometimes even greater. What's your capture rate? All right, experience, 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 experience. Uh, it's everything. And I have a team of designers, um, interior design, graphic design, digital design, and now product design on our team who are creating cool environments to help make the uh, experience such that people say, hey, I want to stick around and buy my glasses or buy my contacts and really get taken care of. So we do digital signage, omni-channel engagement through Content Link, our digital signage company, and very progressive store design. We work with practices uh, and companies of all sizes. So if you're just um, acquiring a practice or cold start, we're here for you. If you're, you got a big old practice, we're here for you too. Um, something to note about OMG and Content Link is we're one of the few independent, truly independent players in this space. Um, the, uh, there's a few other players that are owned by large companies that answer to large companies. We answer to you as our client, uh, and that's it. Um, every so often, I got to talk to my banker, but that's about it. So independent and uh, doing great. This year has been great. So give you a quick scenario. 35-year-old um, practice acquired by Young OD. Uh, this is one of our clients. 24% um, net, doing great, right? But the place was outdated. $148,000 invested in a full-scale remodel, to total gut. First year sales were 970. Not bad, 26% net. Second year sales added yeah, almost $400,000. So, and collections per patient went up. So does design matter? Yes, absolutely, absolutely matters. Capture from 46 to 68%. Uh, right. I got my AirPods Pro thing coming on here. You still hear me? Yeah, you're good. Very good. It's, those things take over every so often. It's like all of a sudden, <laughs> AirPods Pro, take it over. Can you talk to your friends at uh, Apple about that, please? <laughs> all right. Um, and really delight all employees with a better work environment. And that's my passion, honestly, is the effective design on patient outcomes and staff happiness. That was my dad's life work as an architect. I could care less about it as a kid, but now I'm super passionate about carrying on that, that effect. Um, and just to give you a quick overview in a video form, um, this is, you know, just some of what we do, right? And this is, uh, this is Chris G and Sarah Chu's practice behind me. And also what we're seeing here, Iron Horse Optometric Group in uh, beautiful Dublin, California. And so, you know, full, fully digitally engaging, beautiful displays, nice colors and the like. And here's their practice again. All right. A couple before and afters. Anybody seen this space before? What's better? What's better, one or two? All right. Here's another one, a little before and after. Pretty clean, right? Oh, anyone going to the exchange this week will be there. So drop on by our booth. Um, this is stuck at Dr. Stacy Jin's practice in Glendale, California, before and after. I think she caught the fish. So uh, we'll let Dr. Jin comment on that. And then the after. So before, after. All right, if you wanna learn more, uh, reach out. I put our contact info in the chat. Thank you so much. I'm really, really excited about the presentation today. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you, Bill. And if you don't know Bill, he is an absolute legend in the fields of design, especially in the optical space. So definitely reach out to him. Look forward to it. All right.
And we're going to move on to our next sponsor, and that is Roya. And they are a fantastic team of web developers. So, Danny, I'm going to let you take the floor. Okay, perfect. So while Bill is going to be designing your physical location, uh, what we like to focus in on Roy is building out your digital location, which happens to be your website. So at Roya, we build um, custom websites. Um, we don't use WordPress or templates. We like to do things a little bit different over here. Uh, we actually built our own platform um, called Canvas from the ground up. So it's on our own proprietary system. We've created a couple of different efficiencies to streamline custom websites at a fraction of the time. So it's at a fraction of the cost for our clients. So just a little um, note here, my shared screen is not currently working. So that's helping me out with the quick um, PowerPoint right over here. So our Canvas platform uh, that we built. Um, so with that, um, if we go to the next slide. Here's a short, uh, am I able to, no, I can't. Hey, Dad, do you mind hitting the next slide, please? Or... Um, this is a quick um, snippet of our dashboard uh, where it's uh, we can track real-time numbers when it comes to performance and data. So typically what we like to do here is put out what we know works, look at that data, and then sort of refine our data when it comes to marketing. Um, the third slide that we have um, is our different levels of website designs that we've created. So there's a couple of different uh, levels, such as our semi-custom level. Uh, we essentially will have a project manager. You'll go over a different series of websites to gain inspiration, talk about what you like and what you don't like, and then essentially we'll present to you a mock-up, a screenshot of what the website could look like. Once you approve the mock-up, then we send it to production to build. Um, also two fully custom options. So built from a blank canvas from the ground up. Um, most of the times you'll see websites out there with the same exact design, the same exact templates, maybe even the same exact content um, with a, more of a fully custom design. It gives you more a little, it gives you more ten, a, a little bit more attention to detail when it comes to design and layout. At the end of the day, we want you to love your website. Uh, because after 12 months, you have ownership. So no more renting to rent templates. You get to rent to own it. Um, in addition, we do digital marketing. So anything from um, creating custom social media ads for you, your posting plan, and then targeted audience through Facebook marketing, um, as well as content strategy when it comes to helping you um, optimize your site to get found for ideal patients. Now we do have the ability to actually do it for you, but through our Canvas platform, we do have the ability to provide you the tools that you can essentially do it yourself. Um, last slide here is our Canvas Studio, which allows you to essentially create custom social media ads yourself. Um, so we have a library of content. So say for an example, we're focusing on pediatrics, type in pediatrics, and there'll be a library of content that you can select customize the messaging, have your brand out there, and you can, with a, as easy as a click of a button, post onto your social media platform yourself. Um, but with that, um, since, um, sorry, you guys didn't get to see my slides, but if you'd like to learn more, um, go ahead and um, click, a, click a shot at that QR if you would like to schedule a demo with, with me um, later this week. Thank you. Oh, Aaron, I think you're on mute. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> but once again, <laughs> you don't want to do that. Yes. <laughs> but once again, now Roy is fantastic for everything when it comes to your website. We got to meet with Danny at Vision Expo and she got to show us everything about it. It is an absolute fantastic resource. So scan that QR code and take a look at what they have to offer because it's, once again, a great resource for your practice and for your website. All right. So we are going to. Go ahead and start the first hour of Cope Approved CE here. So just a few quick reminders. We might have some poll questions. If they do pop up, make sure to answer them to help the speaker curate her content. And there's gonna be a survey at the end of this full event. So make sure to fill that out. That's very important for the speakers and us to see what we can do to improve. And you gotta be present for the entirety of each hour to receive CE credit. Zoom tracks your attendance. If you have any issues with that, 
just email us admin at odysonfinance.com. And see, certificates should be in your email in about three to four weeks. And I want to remind everyone, please check your promotions and spam because they are sent out as a group email. A lot of times they end up there. We get a lot of emails asking where are my CE certificates, so make sure to look for that. But otherwise, let's, uh, let's go ahead and get started. I'm excited for this first hour, and we've got the awesome Dr. Brianna Rue. And Brianna Rue is from Colorado Springs, Colorado. She graduated from the University of Arizona with a business degree where she was also a cheerleader. She graduated from Nova Southeastern University and completed her residency at the Bascom Palmer Eye Institute, where she met her husband, Josh, who is a neuro-OMD. She joined West Broward Eye Care right out of residency and became a partner in 2015. She's the co-founder of Dr. Contact Lens and Techify, which was developed from her passion to keep the profession moving forward and help us compete with technology. She is the immediate past president of the Broward County Optometric Association. She has a five-year-old son, Dalton, who inspired her to get into myopia management and a five-month-old baby, Brennan. She enjoyed standing on her head in yoga, vacationing with her family, listening to technology podcasts, and sharing her passion for myopia management squirrel lenses, and technology with your colleagues. So with that being said, Brianna, I'm going to let you take the floor. Awesome. I'm excited to be here. So let me share my screen and we'll jump right in. Move you guys out of the way so I can get my screen slides going. <clears throat> That's not what I wanted to do. Hold on. All right, Aaron, could you give me like a five minute um, just to keep on track when yeah. we're at the end? And you can see my screen? Yeah, looks good. Awesome. All right, so let's jump right in. So I have given this presentation before to Odys on Finance, but I have updated it some more because obviously technology is always changing and learning from your feedback. So I appreciate everybody for being here. There's my LinkedIn profile. You can find me there. And um, here's my financial disclosures. So as Aaron said, co-founder of Dr. Contact Lens and Techify, as well as very heavily involved in myopia management. So I got to obviously meet up with these fabulous guys at Expo um, and share obviously our passion for moving the industry forward. So always great to make Zoom in reality where we all actually get to meet up. So my goals and promises by the end of this lecture is that I want you to understand the amount of data that you're sitting on in your practice, what it's worth, and how you should be the one using it. I also want you to understand how to get your staff involved, how you're really steering your own ship and your responsibility for that. And again, we're all playing a game. So learn the game of the industry and be the ones to play it. So just kind of hitting home on that. So as Erin introduced, I do have a five-year-old Dalton and a five-month-old. I actually gave this lecture about six days after I had Brennan, which was awesome. So excited again to be here. Thank you all for being here. Again, we either pay with things with time or money, and we don't get rich by spending your time to save money. We get rich by saving your time to make money. And that's, I think, what is behind ODs on Finance and why this group has become such a huge asset to all of us in the industry. So thanks again to Dan Aaron. So the only difference between fear and excitement is our attitudes about it. So we can continue to live in this fear of being eaten up and seeing these conglomerates come in, or we can take that fear and turn it into excitement and we can live our own dreams. And I think that that is what all of us stand for um, when we're presenting or getting involved behind the scenes in industry. It's industry. It's interesting to, to see what industry thinks that we want as optometrists and what we actually want and are asking for. And we have to talk about our voices more and we have to be heard more. And we have to go to these companies and ask them for what we need and what we want to keep up with the innovation. So... We all think, most of us, that we are optometrists first and that we are small business owners second. I want you to flip this around. We are actually small business owners first that happen to be optometrists. And if we don't take care of our businesses the way that we can, we can't be able to practice the way that we want to and take care of our patients. So I want you, as you're going through this presentation, Take the optometry side away from it. We're really good at that. What we need to get better at 
is implementation and bringing technology to our practices to better serve our patients in the end. So we can be here in 10, 15, 30, 50, 100 years from now. So where we need help with this is obviously we're, we're wearing many hats. We have our practice, we have an optical, finance, patient care, HR, a lab, contact lenses. There's many working parts to an optical business. And we're known in the industry to obviously be very bad business people. And that's okay. Just like we went to school for four years or five years if you did a residency, you can start to learn business and it's not hard to do so. Little, little things add up to big results. So we've got to keep learning. Don't be so myopic on your little exam room, right? We have to expand, which is I think what enables us to do this with our reach with ODs on finance and whatnot. So we got to read, right? So here are some of my favorite um, things that I have found success with. One was traction. So we implemented traction in my practice about three years ago and in, in Dr. Contact Lens, and it's taken us to the next level about meetings is really the big one here. The productivity game is one of my favorite YouTube channels. So if you just wanna pick up a book, it breaks it down into 10 easy minutes where they actually draw out the entire book. I still think it's valuable to read the whole book because he does miss a lot, um, but it does give a high level of what's happening behind the book. So you can pick a book a week and or a day and listen to it on your way to work. So we obviously know the pandemic has sped up everything exponentially, right? So in March of 2020, when we all had to shut down, we had to re-innovate ourselves and we had to re-engage ourselves in our practice. And I don't know about all of you, but I've never worked so hard in that two months that we were closed. And we all came out way ahead of where we ever were. So it was a nice break that the world actually got to take. So I'm a true believer in, yes, we can all get down in the dirt, but we can also water these seeds and see them all sprout. So that brings me here to the Jetsons predictions. In 1962, they predicted that we were gonna have a wearable watch, flying cars, robots that took care of our homes. We were gonna be on FaceTime, have some flat screen TVs, be able to swallow pills and really have ever, somebody that does everything for us. So fast forward here, 60 years, it's all come true, right? So if we look back, 60 years is not that long for this cartoon to be thinking of where we were going to be. So I think George Jetson would say, wow, had no idea, right? So what happens if we don't innovate? Just like Blockbuster, and I don't know about all of you, I graduated from high school in the year 2000. I had my Blockbuster card still in my wallet to remind me of what to do. And we used to go, right? on every Friday night, we went to our local blockbuster because Adam Blatchford was hot and that's who was you know, the blockbuster guy behind the thing. And so it's interesting to see obviously as Netflix has come on and Toys R Us is gone and Radio Shack is gone and Circuit City and looking at the companies that have now re-innovated themselves, right? So Polaroid is back, Circuit City with what Best Buy has done, right? They've made it an experience. They've made it about emotion. And so that's important as we're going through. So we are all entrepreneur, entrepreneurs on this messy, messy journey. So some days you wake up, you're excited, then it gets hard. It's working, I messed up. I'm going bankrupt. I was strong, now I suck. Wait a second, my life is great. And so it's important, I think, in your environment that you find your core group of peeps that you can call when you're down in the dumps to help build yourself up. And I think that's what a lot of these Facebook groups are starting to do in a positive way. My favorite saying is the disruptees, meaning us as optometrists, can and will become the disruptors, but we get to be in the driver's seat of all of this. So let's explain what a disruptor is or let's define it. It's a company or form of technology that causes radical change in an existing industry or market by means of innovation. So we have to embrace technology. If Henry Ford had asked the public what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. And here we are with cars, right? So we also have to be early adopters. Technology and how we evaluate it. When you go into these big exhibit halls, it's important that you go there with a mission. Just don't go there to hear these sales pitches, right? I let every single rep in my office, I will give them five minutes, even in between patients, because I know that they've been to seven to 10 other offices before they've been to mine. 
and they're there to make you better. So give them the time of the day. When your staff picks up a sales call, don't just instantly say no, have them take a demo, have them evaluate the process, right? And maybe bring it to you because they could have said no to something that potentially could have made me $200,000. And that's where we have a problem, right? So instead of asking what this will cost me, ask yourself, flip it. What is this going to cost me if I don't do this? Is my practice slowly eroding before me? And is there something that I can do to get my staff doing better things? What is the true ROI, right? As a salesperson now, I get it. Like I'm trying to sell, right? So we are there just to make everybody better, not just to be salespeople. Look at the onboarding process. What is it going to be like? How much time is this going to take? Yes, it's going to be bumpy in the beginning, but that's okay because you're going to come out on the other side. If you look at something that we all had to go through together, which was going from paper charts to an electronic medical record, that's prob probably the heaviest lift any of our practices had gone through. So we can turn paper processes like ordering contact lenses into a better process for our staff and essentially our patients, right? That's why we're all here is for our patients. Look at customer support. Is it easy to get a hold of somebody? Um, go easy on customer support. They really are there to help you. And essentially be easy on the bugs. Technology's broken, right? Probably a lot of you on this call are going through the office mate crystal debacle right now, or a lot of your servers are down. Are you turning lemon, you know, lemons into lemonade? Again, being closed for two months during the pandemic, it's not the end of the world. Give this a way for you to work in your practice or work on your practice instead of in it. So always look for these little blessings that's happening in your life. That brings me to our EHRs and our integrations. So our EHRs are the core of all of our, our practices. They are the neural network. They are the system record, meaning that's where all of the information is. And we all have been taught if it's not in the EMR, it's not done. It's not done, right? And so it's important as innovations are coming. So as many of us on this call and that are sponsors, it's important to understand that when we go to these EHRs and we want to integrate to be able to go back and forth, we get told no a lot. And it's by Fred at XYZ EMR that says, you know what, we don't need you, we're not going to integrate or we're going to build it ourselves. And so it's important for all of us to realize that if you see something, you've got to be the one to go to your EHR and say, why aren't you integrated with this company? How do I get integrated with this company? Because at the essence, they're the ones that are inhibiting all of us from keeping up with the Warby Farkers of the world and the 1-900s, right? So it's important that you are involved in innovation. And that's how you can actually be involved. Be careful of free. Again, I said this at the beginning, don't give your patient data away for free. We all saw probably the Netflix series, right? The most valuable intellectual property in your practice is your patient data. Yet we're tripping over a 2% rebate or a 5% rebate or saving $2 on a box of contact lenses or something for them to come in and get our data. There's only two industries that call their customers users. It's illegal drugs and software companies. And remember, if you're getting something for free, you essentially are the product. So I'm not telling you don't do this, but if you're gonna do it, I want you to also be using the data the way that they're using it. To put this in perspective, and I think this is grossly underestimated, they essentially say that one patient's record on the black market is worth about $1,500. I think it's a lifetime value of a patient is worth way more than that, right? And so if you can just amortize this out over your practice's lifetime, this is upwards of what, 20, 25, 30 grand? So again, don't trip over dollars to pick up a penny. That brings me here to ROI. So as all of us, I've been searching myself for two new teammates. We just actually let a person go on Thursday. So team, member, team members are getting more expensive, right? And I live in South Florida. And so, and I know Dad and Aaron obviously living on the other coast and my partner, Jen, living on the other coast. This is 
essentially doesn't exist there for $16 an hour. But let's just look at this as an example. So $16 an hour essentially costs you as a business owner 22 bucks with benefits, taxes, workman's comp, toilet paper, coffee, breaks, whatever that you're giving to your staff. So you're essentially paying them $3,500 a month. And there was an interesting post on Odie's on Finance recently talking about what you can get per staff member. And this ranged from what, $150,000 to somewhere I saw like 400,000 per employee. So it, again, depends on how you're implementing technology. So it lets use the benchmark that really everybody uses is $150,000. So you're essentially making $12,500 off that employee. After you net out everything, that employee made you about $9,000 a month. If you employ a piece of technology that costs you $249 a month, what you're doing here that can bring you potential revenue of $200,000, you're now $249 a month, your cheapest employee that's not going to talk back, that doesn't take break, that shows up on time, is making you about $16,000 a month. If you net that back out for what you spent on the technology, it's making you about $16,000 a month. So almost double and it costs you a fraction of what you were actually making, right? So staff implementation. I love to say that I am the queen of my castle. In essence, I'm not really all of the time the queen of my castle. I get it, I gotta go back and get approval from a lot of my staff members. But it's important that they understand your vision of why you're doing something and that we're not in this to just try something. We're in it to make it work for them so we can start to hit our bonuses and be there for our patients. So when you're going into exhibit halls or you're going into demos, remember that not making a decision is actually a decision. It's a decision to stay the same. And that's okay. A lot of this stuff may not be for you, but look at it with open eyes. So implementation, let your staff know. So 2022, we're already three, you know, first quarter's already done, right? How fast did this go? So plan out your next calendar. What are you gonna implement? And how are you going to implement a strategy? Choose five or focus on something every month that you're gonna implement and make sure that your staff is on board and behind you because they can only get better and we can all only get better. Continue to network because we know your network is your net worth, right? So that's again, thank you for joining me on a Sunday. So let's get into the, the meat here. So what is a healthcare disruptor? So companies who are shifting the healthcare industry by making big changes, significantly redefining the way that healthcare is delivered. They're integrating new technologies. We've got big people coming into healthcare technology, right? Meta, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, Apple, CVS, Aetna, right? Everybody wants a piece of this. And it's important as doctors that we continue, we're in this fight, right? We can't keep getting cut out because that doctor-patient relationship, if we keep cutting that out with technology, the entire industry loses, so do the doctors and the patients and everybody in it. So we're at the center of that universe. And I think a lot of companies are forgetting that. Why do they want to disrupt? Obviously cost, right? It's all about money at the end of the day. So between these three companies, Amazon, Berkshire, and JP Morgan, they employ more than a million workers, and that's probably an old stat. Healthcare spending is about 18% of the U.S. economy, and 20% of medical care was unneeded including about a quarter of tests, a fifth of prescriptions, and more than one in 10 medical procedures. So they've come together to form a new healthcare company. So what does it take for us? We've got to break existing norms. We've got to do things really the way that they need to be done, right? So tearing off, for example, a contact lens trial and putting that in a box and having Susan at the front desk go in and order those the old way, right? Something as simple as that, Look at processes that are broken. Shape our culture. We've got to rethink the way things have always been done. We have to be authentic and transparent. That's what consumers are wanting. They're essentially healthcare consumers. So what does it take? We've got to engage our people. We've got to leverage networks. We have to reinvent our business models and envision ongoing enhancements. We've always got to keep improving. One thing, building a technology company, I thought when we launched version one, that was it. I didn't understand that technology is never done. And that's actually a really cool place to be. So if you look at what Facebook has done into Meta and all of this other things that are coming, they're never comfortable. 
And when you do get comfortable, that's a very vulnerable place to be. So this brings me to our business life cycle, right? As the doctor wearing so many hats, we are there to take care of our staff who take care of our patients who then take care of us. A lot of us skip some of these steps, but what I think we have to do is we have to add technology in here. So we have to invest in technology that's going to help our staff do their jobs. So getting rid of a lot of mundane tasks who then take care of the patients who become raving fans because they got things delivered to where they wanted them to be. And then that essentially takes care of us as the doctors. Where we go wrong in this model is we're truly not taking care of the patient by not considering their wants and needs. We're not truly valuing our staff's time, which has them looking for other jobs, wanting to work from home. We have them doing very low profit, mundane tasks. I don't know if you've ever answered the phone and made an appointment recently. That call alone can take seven to 10 minutes or checked in a patient. Are all of those questions you're asking on your forms necessary? Could that be automated? Looking for ways to cut corners to see more patients. None of us on this call have gotten a raise from these vision plans in what, 20 years? So we have to see more patients. But not necessarily do we have to see more patients. We need to see better paying patients. So don't be busy just to be busy. Be busy with, with the patients that you want to see. And we have, aren't implementing ways on how we are consumers, right? We get everything shipped to our door. Why aren't we doing the same? So again, we can't do all of this by ourselves. We got to delegate to elevate. When I learned about delegation is I wasn't so good at it um, pre my first baby Dalton. What I understood really early on was I had to reinterpret or reassign what delegation meant to me. So what I did is I redefined it and I said, if somebody does something 51% of the way I would have done it, that is a huge win. And people will surprise you if you give them the opportunity to do so. So delegation comes in four steps. You've got to assign the task, define the task with the person, put a date on it that the task is supposed to be accomplished, and then reevaluate how it was done so you can look for improvements or give um, credit due. So again, we're all busy. Everything is be del being delivered to our door and healthcare is starting to go that way. And there's little things that we can do again to not be cut out of this equation. Patients want things on their own times. They wanna make appointments, order contact lenses, shop for glasses, online refractions essentially, right? All of us on this, we know that a refraction is part of the visual system. We can learn more about a refraction than anybody can in that 90 seconds that we're refracting, right? So it's part of the visual system. This cannot be cut out. And that's our opportunity to educate our patients of the refraction is just a piece of the visual system. We can buy anything online. We have long wait times. It's too hard to get back to us. Obviously online refractions and who wants to be open 24 seven, right? I'm not 7-Eleven, and I don't want to be refracting from a beach on my vacation, right? So there's a lot of interesting things coming here. Globe Check has, this is actually rolling out in a lot of ophthalmology offices and becoming a technician, essentially. So could we gather all of this data in under seven minutes and then go in and spend more face-to-face -face time with the patient? <coughs> Excuse me. So patient center care. We've got to start with the patient in mind with everything that we do. We have to take in care of the patient from start to finish, so they return. Innovate for that patient experience, including charging patients the right amount. Stop discounting. When you discount, you can't invest in your practice. And whenever somebody comes into my practice and, wow, Dr. Rue, you have the greatest and latest, I said, thank you, because you investing in me, being here in my chair, allows me to invest in you. So right there, I just asked for a referral without asking for a referral. And you want to give them the control that they're asking for. Some patients know how to ask. Most don't, or even worse, won't, even if they wanted to. And that's those patients asking for a copy of their prescription. So what happens if we aren't truly patient-centric? We end up with unhappy patients, unhappy reviews. We go online and say, wow, look at this bad review I got. Poor me, right? Don't. Don't beat yourself up about a bad review. Maybe that patient got cut off in traffic on their way to your office and they're in a bad mood, right? Who knows where that stemmed from? We also look greedy. We get, and we take it personally. 
So here, this was a post. I unfortunately got a one-star review because I had not put the patient's PD on their prescription. Who puts the PD on their patient's prescription? 513 of us responded, never. Do you really think that you're going to save that patient ordering from your office by not giving them their PD? This is already a lost patient, so this gives you an opportunity to be better. Again, we're all looking at this work-life balance. Um, and that comes into, again, taking care of yourself, taking care of your practice, employing new staff members, and kind of squishing and condensing your schedule so you're not actually working in your practice all the time. You give yourself time to work on it. So we've got to techify our patient experience. So we've actually defined what techify means. It's an optimal practice integrating one or more revenue generating technologies to optimize the patient experience and maximize profits. And when I talk to many of us, a lot of us are all about saving money, not about making more money. We're all happy at that 140, 150. If you just make little tweaks, you can go from 150, pay off your student loan, and be making 200 or 250. There's no reason all of us, by employing little things between Roya, 1284, OMG, other things, um, to get to that level. It's little, little tweaks. So we got to start with the patient in mind. So what kind of experience do you want them to have? You got to find where your core is. I am in West Fort Lauderdale, so not East, very different family-oriented beach people, right? And so I understand where I function is right in the middle. And I've gotten really good at functioning right in the middle. I'm not going to be a high-end boutique where my practice is versus somebody on the beach. So you can learn from where you are with demographically, but we can all have a friendly staff and service. We can all run on time, keep our technology up to date, be there convenient and make it easy. So if patients hate it, you should change it. I have never done the puff test in our practice. And I came into a practice that never did that. It was a 35 year old practice. Walk through the start to finish in your clinic from patients finding you to picking their glasses up. And if they hate something, we got to change it, right? So I have this sign, my door in my office is right next to my pretest area. I can't tell you how big of a practice builder this one little thing is. And the relief that people get sitting in that chair, knowing that they are not going to be puffed in the eye. This is probably one of my two biggest practice builders. Automation, we can automate reviews, appointments, appointment reminders, paperwork, contact lens ordering, calling for pickups, right? You always do something the way that you did. You always get what you're always going to get. So start with the needing an appointment. How are patients finding you, right? These vision plans, and I don't think the way of the future is to drop the vision plans unless you're going to throw $500,000 into marketing. This gives you an opportunity to get a patient in the door to now sell dry eye, myopia management, um, aesthetics, right? Get into other things that are going to make that patient more profitable. This is just giving you the opportunity to get that patient in your door. Do you need to be seeing 25 to 30 patients a day? No. My max is 17. I turn into a pumpkin at 18, right? And I'm very heavily myopia management. So in that one day, I will have a way more profitable day because I'm seeing the patients that I want to see. Then they'll go and search your website, make sure that you have really good reviews. So work on your reviews. The next one next to me only has 66. So where do you think this person's going to go? And they're also, are they close to you? I drive by 30 doors before I get to my practice in the morning. And we are, we're booked out. It's an exciting place to be. Don't worry about the competition. Become the competition. So your website, this is your first presentation to the world. So make sure that it's pretty. Make sure that it's up to date. There's four things people want to do on there. They want to see what your phone number is. They most likely want to tech you, text you. They want to book an appointment. They want us to be able to register their forms, look at your inventory that you have, and order contact lenses. All the other fluff is for SEO, getting people there. So make sure that it's ADI compliant and that this is really easy to find on your website. The average person, you've got 17 seconds to put your first foot forward, right? This brings me to website chat bots and live chat. Make sure there's a chat or a live chat on your website. So what's interesting here, commonly asked questions, what are your hours? What insurances or vision plans do you take? Can you make an appointment? Can you cut down on phone time? So what's interesting, employing live chat on our website, look when people 
are chatting with us. So if you, we don't close for lunch, but sometimes we do because we'll have a rep lunch or something, right? So if I'm closed between 12 and two, I missed all of these opportunities, right? So if you're not employing something like this, again, low hanging fruit. And look, some people are on your website. These are all the new moms that are feeding their babies at night, getting some stuff done. So you've got to be available there to answer some questions. So that comes here to needing an appointment, existing patients. Did they have a good experience? Did they get reminded old school, new school? And when can they go in? If you're booked out more than three weeks, make sure that you can get those new patients in. If you are seeing below 12% new patients, your practice is actually eroding. If you're seeing 15% new patients, you're stable. And if you're seeing more than 20% new patients, you're growing. So it's very important that you're honest with yourself on when you can get new patients in. You always should save one appointment in the morning and one appointment in the evening on every single day for a new patient appointment so you can get them in. Patient recall, evaluate your method and effectiveness. Most patients need to hear from you in three forms, text, call, postcard. Pre-appoint. You can increase your pre-appointing by just, again, prescribing, not recommending an annual eye exam and why you want to see them back. <coughs> Excuse me. Let me take a sip here. You also want to get your staff involved in the downtime. And don't be scared to remind patients. We all have honor intake forms on how we're going to acknowledge patients and remind them. So make sure in your forms that you have all of those. Call versus texting. I don't know how many of you have answered a phone call from a number that you don't know. Probably never, right? So 25, 27 trillion text messages were exchanged in 2020. 95% of texts will be read within three minutes with a response within 90 seconds. 84% of consumers won't answer a call from an unknown number. So that's your office. 98% open rate for text messages versus 20% from email. A recommendation on the ODs on finance was A World Without Email by Cal Newport. Great book. Email should all die. 74% of people have zero unread text messages and 70% zero unread emails. And there's a 45% response rate from text messages versus 6% with email. So why customers are texting businesses is to reply to order confirmations, reply to appointment reminders. When I was in my, they like to call it, you know, old lady pregnancy, I had to go to many, many visits. What kept me on track was literally that two hour text telling me I had an appointment coming <clears throat> up. I would have missed so many visits had I not had that last minute reminder. So postcards bring me to here, we still do postcards. People still go to their mail, right? And so on here, I would highly recommend our first run at these. We forgot the three little lines. Unbelievable how many people don't know how to fill out a postcard. So if you're still going to do this, I have them fill it out because somebody's going to look at their own handwriting and it gives you a touch point. Don't forget the lines. Making the appointment. Again, are you old school having them call you? Or are they requesting an appointment or can they actually make a physical appointment? If you don't make one change here, make sure that you implement this. You can still control your schedule by blocking off the first one of the day, first one before lunch, last one after when you come back from lunch and the last two of the day, right? You still have control of your schedule, but you're wasting so much time on the phone or on these appointment requests going back and forth to get an appointment schedule. So online bookings, 2017, 2.4% of appointments are self-booked. In 2020, only 11% of appointments are booked online, but I think that's because we're not offering this. So again, you can offer this in a good way. Missed appointments cost the U.S. healthcare system $150 billion each year, right? Some of us like to have that little break in our schedule. I don't, right? You took up my time slot. So we should value that and charge appropriately for no-shows. So automating appointments, text, email, three days, one day prior, day of appointment, and a cancellation policy. Let them know you're reserving an appointment time for them and that you expect them to show up. This brings me here to checking patient benefits and automation. So the average practice has a dedicated staff member to pull 
and check authorizations of benefits. And then are we utilizing family members appointments? So hi, Susie, I see that you have a five-year-old and a three-year-old on your plan. Why don't we get them in when you come in? 40% of benefits for eye exams and eye go unused. So again, if you're not gonna take all the plans, you can look into something like Anagram to again, make your fishing pond bigger. Patient forms, how do people do it? It starts with the staff, incentives, and then blame COVID. So this was one of the huge things that we pushed forward and have never gone back is online forms. Be able to text that patient and does it integrate back into your EMR? If it doesn't and it just gives you a PDF, you're wasting your time because now you have to do double data entry. I am not about double data entry at all. How many times do you go to a physician and they ask you the same question three times? Tells you nobody's listening. So listen again to your patients. The exam, again, I have the four, we all have an old four opter, right? Which just turned a hundred years old in January of 2022. Hasn't really changed much, right? But the automated four opter, not only has it saved my shoulders, but also it's a wow factor for patients. And then are you implementing technology to your advantage with topography, my mammography, auto refraction? We all know a picture is worth a thousand words. So every day, there's two things I can't live without in my office. Number one is my OptoMap, right? I pet that thing every day. It was down for the last three weeks because of a who knows what. So walking by that, I was like, oh my God, when is this thing coming back online? So something as little as that can not only help you diagnose and manage, but that wow factor. And other things like a Hero device, wearables are definitely coming in, saving on a huge footprint, right? And so as technology is keeping up with us, we get some really cool things. So having done a ton of fill-in, trying to pay off my student loan, which I did in November of 2020, um, took me 10 years, six months and 14 days but who was counting? Um, I can't tell you how many times I filled in to still find these type of charts. Something as little as this can make a huge difference in your practice. Again, low hanging investments. Now we're gonna switch from the patient to the consumer. So everybody, all of us is optometrists. We want them to stay a patient. We forget that they're a, they're a consumer, right? And really who owns the patient at the end of the day? Is it the vision plan or us? So a patient quote here is, I want to support my eye doctor, but I'm not a charity. So that's telling them that we have to be more transparent. And we want them to stay patients again while everybody else is trying to turn them into a consumer. In my office here, I have a line where they actually are a patient and then they become a consumer. One of the doctors in my practice, he's the, the, um, the existing doctor that we bought the practice from. He does not pass this line in the office. It's actually pretty funny. And one of my biggest practice builders is this actually this little wall of the Polaroid pictures of all the little kids because I'm a huge myopia practice. When they all walk by this hallway and they say, oh my gosh, you guys see kids? Well, yes, we do, right? So I'm promoting what kind of patients I want to see within my practice with subtle messages. How is it done is the handoff. Is it done in the exam room? Is it done out in the optical? Is it walking the patient up to the front desk and reiterating everything that you said? That little walk, somebody's gonna forget about 90% of that information that you said. So start making those emotional connections with the patients because that's essentially how you buy. <clears throat> you buy with emotion and you also buy with logic. So who's involved? Is it the doctor, the technician, the optician, the front desk? And in the optical, how are we taking measurements? Are we still holding up PD rulers, right? I know old school sometimes is better than new school, but we've got to take this to the next level. And then how are you presenting the, the purchases to the patients? Is it this cool thing that you can print out and give the patient so they can reorder from you? Are you still writing it down, crossing stuff out, looking through their vision plans, right? So really cool things coming on the market. Package deals, we've got to kiss the optical. We've got to keep it super simple, right? So kiss this process. So something like 1284 is a package deal. So something here with a cohesive brand, 
keeping all of these frames on your board is consignment. So we want these frames to be turning two to three times. When we take that frame off the board and we ship it off to the lab, right? Now that's missing. And that probably was one of my best sellers. So it's not gonna be replenished for the next six to eight weeks. So that was fun for the patient and for me. So either buy better or go into something like consignment to help free up your cash flow. And look at the true economics and offer value. If you have this wall for these package deals to compete with these things at the bottom, look at the frame sitting there. Would you want that on your own face? Probably not. So adopting something like this can take your optical to the next level. It's really funny in the exhibit hall, walking by people when we see optical, watching an optometrist, because our optical, it's, uh, it's a lot of numbers. It's pretty hard to learn. I'm still in the process of learning it about inventory and how we take things out and what's on the board, right? Yet that makes me 60% of my revenue. But I walk by it with blinders on all day. So maybe take the three, next three months and focus on that, right? Bringing me here to virtual try-on. So getting your inventory online. If you have, let's say, Gucci on your thing and they click on that link, does that take them away from your website or does it take you into your inventory, right? So little things that we're doing to build other people's businesses while not building our own. Bringing here to contact lens ordering, make sure you're evaluating your own process. Utilize that direct ship to patient. Nothing comes to my office anymore. And how are you going after reorders? And again, are you tearing off this little foil, putting it into somebody's desk drawer and having them go at the end of the day to reorder it? There's 28 steps from start to finish to place a contact lens order. If you've not done this, I highly recommend that you go in on Monday, tomorrow, and just place an order and see what your staff goes through. It is mind blowing. They've got to come back here. Unpack the box, slap a right left sticker on it, call the patient 20 times, and now that you're doing they, now you're throwing the box at the patient. So the lost revenues and increased overhead is a huge opportunity in all of our practices here. Walking scripts can account for $100,000 of erosion. Every time we print that paper copy to a patient, which we have to do with FTC rule, we're handing them $300 on average to go spend on someone else's site. The staff time that it takes, we're wasting about 325 hours annually. And again, no easy way for the staff or the patient. In this is a recent study here, 2021 estimates. So 61% of people purchase from their practices. And look at the other things here. This is the erosion in all of our practices. You may think your annual supply rate and your capture rate are good. Take it a step further. Our most valuable patients in our practices are our contact lens patients. They come back the most often, they have the most issues and they have the most family members. That's where we're gonna build our dry eye myopia aesthetic. So if I just hand that patient, that 35 year old minus three a copy of their prescription because they didn't wanna order, not only did I lose their family, but essentially all these other clinics that I'm trying to build. So how valuable is your staff time? So in something like, Dr. Contact Lens here, you can pull in all of your demographic information for your patients and we become a customer success management tool. What that is, is a CRM essentially for your contact lens patients, customer relationship management platform. So this, we have 1,200 expired patients sitting here and 346 that are due to reorder. Each one of these to my practice on average is worth about 300 bucks and each one of these is $175. So would I rather go after these patients or have my staff wasting 28 steps to process an order? So what's it costing you to not have an online platform, 100K in walkout scripts, these reorder reminders, non-compliant patients, we want them to come back every, every 12 months instead of every, every 18 months. And as you sell more contacts, you get more icing on the cake, right? So this FTC rule, as more regulations are coming at us, it's important that we use these regulations to our benefit. Here's how we did it. Provide these patients with a digital copy of the prescription. And you got to retain evidence that it was sent, received, and made accessible, downloadable, and printable. The big boys thought that they were actually putting this in for their benefit. When it says since you can use it for yours. So what we like to do, again, disruptees becoming the disruptors. Put it in your gift shop. Allow them to order in one click. Make it easy. Make it accessible. 
So just like Space Mountain lets us off in their gift shop, they do that for a reason. Exit through your gift shop, make it easy. Show them that they can use their vision plan benefits and the rebates. And the curve here is crazy. So knowing about this side of this industry very deeply, it's very interesting when I'm talking to a lot of our colleagues and they think that their annual supply rate's super high, their capture rate's really, really high. Let's break it down. So if you have a thousand contact lens patients and a lot of you on this, on this call are probably saying, I don't need a service like this because I am amazing. Kudos to you, but we can all do better, right? Very low hanging fruit. If your capture rate's 80%, that means 200 patients walked out of your door not giving them the ability to order from you. Take it a step further. If your annual supply rate's 50%, I built a platform and mine's only at 40%. That means that 400 patients need a reminder to reorder from you. So if you add up this side of the bucket or this side of the pie, 200 patients walked, 400 patients need a reorder reminder. We're letting the online world go after 600 of our patients if we think we're doing really well. Three, five minutes. Okay, so e-commerce is obviously at us in every sense of the imagination, right? So we've got to be there where the patients want to be met. They don't want to be coming back at five o'clock to pick up a box. And we're not showing them a sunglass that just came in. So using that excuse to get patients back is not really there. So bringing me to payment options. Look at your payout system, your point of sale system here. Has it been updated? Do you take credit, debit, tap, swipe, Bitcoin, Tesla stock, right? Charge your patients the right amount and give them the ability to break it up over time. And remember, you're not the bank at the end of the day, right? So there's other people that can help you with that. 74% of patients would upgrade or buy more with buy now, pay over time. So you have something like Sunbit, which is not a hard credit pool or you have something like care credit, which only authorizes higher level credit people. So this again, allows you to go buy now, pay over time over other things. And differentiate, sell what you recommend. Why am I recommending a dry eye drop for you to go up to Walgreens up the street? I don't care if I'm only making eight bucks off of that. Again, all of these little things add up and you become that one-stop shop for these patients. Little, foul, little wow factors, again, no puff tests. We've got obviously great deals with eye care and other things out there. I still do personally Goldman. A, no puff test here. Adding a baby changing table station. This actually went in after I had my son. If I had to change him on one more floor of a bathroom, it was disgusting. Again, little technology, a door hook. Put door hooks everywhere. New paint. When was the last time you painted? New equipment. As I said, one of the other things that I get the most complimented on in my office is this stupid tiger chart. It's a near chart. I check near vision on every single patient because what are we doing all day? Looking at our phones. I get more compliments on this, on my old four opter. Wow, I've never seen anything like this. And it takes two seconds. And again, just updating your optical. So what does it look like? A little flooring, a little paint. You can close for three days and be back up and go, the sky's the limit there. So in-office advertising, show your patients what kind of patients you want to see. Just get them in the door. By now, pay over time. Here's some low-hanging fruit. So put your ego aside. Remember how you shop. All of us probably have a box outside of our door from Amazon, right? Patients understand that we don't want to leave our houses anymore. So again, that's what has them leaving your office and going to something where they want to be met. So no longer are we allowed to hold patients hostages to our practice with their PD and their contact lens prescriptions, right? Play the game. Get your staff involved with the decision-making process. Quick story here. Put in a platform in an office. Showed them, this was four weeks ago, showed them where $270,000 was hiding in one click. She came back to me a week later and she goes, Brianna, we're not actually not going to move forward with you guys. Perfect. So let me just show you where $270,000 is. What I was thinking was saying, okay, you're, she said her staff voted and they didn't want to move forward. I'm sorry, your staff voted for you to not make $270,000. Here's your money back. I hope that you come up with something. It doesn't have to be us. Use something. 
but you need to go and fire every single one of your staff members because they don't have your business at the core value. But that's also up to you, again, as the business owner, not the doctor. Focus on one new thing every 90 days. So a dream written down with a date becomes a goal. A goal broken down into steps becomes a plan and a plan backed by action makes your dreams come true. So the disruptees can and will become the disruptors with people like Aaron and Dad and all of us on this call that are moving it forward. Optometry is a really big gift to all of us. So don't stay in the demon gloom. Fear and excitement again, it's your attitude about it. And I'm so excited to hear Javier's talk. Who's next? I'm so happy that I went before him. <laughs> Thank you, Aaron. If you have not watched his TED talk, do yourself a favor for 10 minutes. It is unbelievable. It's so super. thank you guys. And you know how to find me. All right. Thank you, Brianna. That was a fantastic lecture. I've, I've heard it a few times now and every time it gets a little bit better, you add a little bit more to it. So <laughs> thank you. And if you have any questions for Bree, just feel free to put them in the chat or the Q&A and I'm sure she'll stay for a few minutes to answer those. And before we jump into the rest of the presentation, a quick bathroom break for everyone that needs to, you know, relieve themselves or grab another coffee or grab an alcoholic beverage, whatever you want to do this morning. And while we're doing that, we're going to have our first raffle. And so we, I'm going to spin this little thing. You can't see it on my screen, unfortunately, but let's see who the winner is. And this is going to be for a hundred dollar gift card on Amazon. So Paige Frost. Paige Frost, if you're in the audience, you have won the $100 gift card. So email us, admin at odysonfinance.com to claim that. It's a digital card, so we'll just send it right over to you. So once again, Paige Frost, you are the winner of the first intermission $100 raffle. All right, now we're going to go ahead and jump ahead. While we're doing our little intermission here, we're going to have a couple sponsors uh, talk a little bit, and then we'll jump into Beer's talk in just a few minutes here. So I want to introduce 1284. Uh, 1284 is a fantastic resource. Natasha is the founder and CEO, and she's going to tell you a little bit more about how you can add some high value to your optical. So Natasha, I'll let you take it over. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, let me see if I can just do a quick screen share. Let's see. All right. Can you see my screen? Yep. Okay, perfect. So I actually, I don't know how many of you have seen what a sheet of acetate looks like coming out from a press for the first time, um, but it's quite fascinating. In fact, if you've never really seen or know too much about acetate, this picture here in the person's hand, that's actually what it, what it starts out as, a very organic substance and then gets dyed the color that it is. And if you have a tortoise frame, then it's these like little chips that are created. And then an artist is actually um, putting it in the box right there that sits through it and makes it into a pattern, uh, a tortoise pattern. So I don't know, this industry tends to be a little bit uh, closed off sometimes. And you don't really get to see as much transparency as I think we deserve, especially since you're putting a product out on uh, your shelves. And so um, it's pretty cool. It's a total art form. And I, I shot this video in uh, the Guangdong province of China. And, uh, and there it is. There's the sheet of acetate and what it looks like. It's pretty cool. And from there, it gets put into an amazing pattern and or I mean, polished into a beautiful pair of glasses. Um, but there's a lot that goes into it before it. I mean, tech drawing after tech drawing and lots and lots of work, molds that get created, having it cut, CNC cut, uh, assembled, uh, balanced so that it's in perfect synchronicity, uh, quality control checks over and over and over until you finally get that finished product. Um, so there's a lot that goes into it and we've done this for you, uh, from beginning to end to, to create an in-house brand for you. One that's frame lenses and AR all in one under the brand 1284, the year glasses were invented in Italy, where every frame is named after a city around the world with a cool description 
just so that you can feel there's a story behind it and something you can also feel proud of to sell in your practice. Because the reality is, is, you know, forget Warby Parker right now for single vision. I mean, they are taking away your progressive patients as well. Um, that's where the real value is. Um, I mean, there's lots of ability to create just a, a package with, you know, some, some overstock frames for single vision, some, you know, a, a stock lens that you can use. But, you know, what are you doing for your progressives? Because the price that people are seeing is the 295 to 395 price point. And that's where 1284 can be of real huge value because you can charge that same amount of range right there. If you look at the progressive between 250, 399, 349 is even better if your market can support that. And the reality is, is it's not even Warby Parker, it's grandma and grampy and me, soccer mom, going to Costco and seeing these kind of prices. And so how do we navigate through that? And, um, you know, while you're still able, though, to get a very nice, healthy profit margin, but just by diversifying your price point and recognizing that not everybody can pay $800, $700, $600 for a pair of glasses, um, you can still make a really nice profit margin. Um, and so take a look kind of like what Brianna, she was just talking about this with contact lenses, super powerful statement. It's the same thing with glasses. If you are capturing, let's say 60% of your patients, but 40% are leaving, can you capture just one out of those four people? Um, that's 10%. So if you have 150 eye exams and you could actually do 15 pairs of 1284 glasses, um, at an average of $270, you're adding a net profit of $2,500 per month. Um, that's powerful. It adds up to $30,000 a year. And our practices do so much more than that and surprise the heck out of themselves too. So um, there's so much more to this conversation. And so I'm going to actually continue this conversation with the incomparable Steve Alexander from Anagram on May 3rd, if you can join us for a conversation, I Wear Is I Care. And we'll cover these four topics you see here. So please join us, sign up. Um, I think if Aaron or Dad or I can put the link to the webinar um, in the chat after, but please join us. And otherwise scan this QR code and, and get on a conversation with me and, and we can totally help your practice be successful with 1284. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you, Natasha. Yeah, 1284 is fantastic. And I encourage a lot of you out there to take a look at it, see what they have to offer. And just a quick teaser, we're actually going to be doing a uh, five-part webinar with uh, Steve Alexander. Uh, that's coming up very soon. It's how to drop BCPs out of your practice. So uh, stem from a few things that have occurred over the past few months. So uh, I think it's going to be a great program. But once again, thank you, Natasha. Scan that QR code if you're interested to learn more. All right, and then we're going to give back the floor back to Roya real quick. Uh, mm -hmm. We had a few mishaps with the slides. Mm -hmm. uh, Danny, if you want to just take over, and I'm just going to advance the slides yeah. for you. <laughs> okay. I can, uh, this will stop others. Okay, continue. Um, slow. Nope, it's doing it again. Um, do you mind sharing my screen? Maybe, maybe your mom did. Oh, she did. Someone did. But you did it. She did. All right. Okay. So we're going to try this one more time. <laughs> Cross your fingers. Let's see. Can you guys hear me? You're good. Yeah. Yep. You. Okay. Awesome. So once Bill helps design your optical and then you bring in a really great product, 1284 into your optical, they're focusing on more of your physical location. We're at Roya. We like to focus in your digital location, right? Which happens to be your website. You know, since the pandemic, um, most clients are reaching out like, hey, what can I do right now to continue to keep business going? When it, And so with that, we resulted into what can we do with the website? What are other technologies that we can incorporate to our website to keep revenue um, going? So with that, uh, we act at Roya, uh, we actually built our own technology, our own platform called Canvas, uh, where we developed this platform from the ground up. So it's on our own proprietary system. 
Uh, we've actually created a couple of different efficiencies that I'm excited to show you guys today, where we can streamline custom websites at a fraction of the time, so it's a fraction of the cost to our clients as well. Um, we also want you to love your website at the end of the day because you have ownership of your site. So quick snippet on the next slide. Um, this is a quick um, preview of what our dashboard looks like. Uh, we always wanna make sure that we're tracking our website and how it's performing um, through analytics and data. Uh, we can even track different KPIs as well of, hey, did someone jump onto doctor contact lenses and then clicked onto your website? Or did someone go into Optify first and then clicked onto your website? So knowing, tracking all of those metrics and what's performing well, so you can allocate some of your efforts and budget towards that as well. Then the next slide, uh, we do like to take more of a tailored approach to developing sites or website designs. So most of the time you're gonna be selecting a template or maybe you're using WordPress uh, where you know it's kind of like plug and play and then boom, we have a website. Um, essentially with us, we like to take more of a tailored approach. You'll have a dedicated project manager. You'll go over design consultation, um, go over a couple of different websites to gain inspiration, talk about what you like, what you don't like. And then essentially we'll present to you a mock-up, a screenshot of what the website could look like. Once you approve the mock-up, we send it into production to actually develop the front and the back end of the site. Okay. Um, in addition to that, uh, we also help with social media marketing. Um, instead of posting, you know, posts just to post, uh, we like to tailor what we're posting of what's going on and aligning with what's going on in your office. So we'll come up, we'll design a custom um, posting plan for you and design assets. But in addition to that, we'll even back it up with a budget to hit more of a targeted audience on social, such as age, demographic, profession, interest, location where we, we do all of that for you. Um, in addition, next slide, um, we have, we'll also come up with content strategy uh, when it comes to search engine optimization and targeting ideal patients through organic search and keywords. So um, coming up with not just, maybe I wanna get found for orthokeratology in my area, we're not just gonna come up with content um, in relation to ortho -K. We'll identify through tools that we have what patients are actually searching for within your local area and then come up with a content strategy um, for your SEO. Um, so this is with us doing it all for you. Now with Canvas, we do have tools on the back end where for an example, you wanted to design a social media asset yourself, but you don't know where to start. So we have a platform where you can upload your own images, have your logo embedded in there, um, uh, optometry specific content, and then preview what your post will look like for before posting it. And then at an easy click of a button, you can post that asset over to your social platform um, yourself. And that's pretty much it. If you have any other questions, um, for me, go ahead and schedule a demo. I'm happy to learn more about your practice and see what we can do to help. All right, awesome. Thank you, Danny. And once again, apologize for the earlier mishap with the screen share. So, no, thank you. All right, so scan that QR code if you're interested in working with Roya. All right, and then we are gonna jump into our second hour of COPE approved CE. So once again, same guidelines as before. And before I do that, I think Raymond Brill, who always has some great advice, uh, he put a fantastic quote on the chat. He said, not making a decision about improvement is making a decision fail faster to get ahead. I think those are two fantastic pieces of advice that a lot of us should follow. And with that being said, I'm gonna introduce our next speaker. Uh, and it goes right along in that vein. Uh, this is Dr. Harbir Sian. He's an award-winning optometrist whose passion lies in education and his profession. Harbir studied kinesiology and attended his Bachelor of Applied Science degree at Simon Fraser University. He then moved to Boston to study at New England College of Optometry and graduated with a Doctor of Optometry degree in 2010. Dr. Sion returned to Vancouver to begin practicing and it soon be became abundantly clear that too many people were unaware of the importance of their eye health. Harbir knew he needed to spread the word. Since then, Dr. Sion has written many blogs, started multiple video series, including For Your Eyes Only, with Anne Kiasma and launched the 2020 podcast. Traveled to South America and the Middle East to perform eye exams in underdeveloped areas and has been awarded Young Optometrist of the Year by the BC Doctors of Optometry. And just like Bria said, if you haven't seen his TED Talk, definitely take a look at it. It's very inspirational. So with that being said, Harvey, the floor is yours. Oh, can you hear me? You're good. 
Awesome. Well, thank you for that introduction, Aaron. That was very kind. Um, and thank you, Brianna, for <laughs> shouting me out. I did not expect that. Um, got me a little flustered here for a second. Well, expectations are starting to get a little too high, I feel like. I'm going to bring it all down to earth a little bit. But uh, thank you. That that I have to say that TED Talk was a very, very special moment for me in my career. Um, and to be able to share the the message of the importance of eye care really was on that stage was was really special. So uh, if you do get a chance to watch it, please, uh, please do. And I hope you hope you enjoy it. I would always I always appreciate feedback. If anybody wants to get in touch with me and tell me what they thought, please do. Uh, let me share my screen here. Oh, yeah, and I got to make sure I'm doing the there's a little bit of audio in here, so I just got to make sure that we got that too. Sorry, guys. I almost forget to click that button. All right, how are we doing? Can you see that? Okay, awesome. All right, so um, I'm here to talk about e-commerce and eye care. I mean, Brianna's presentation was incredible, right? I feel like so inspired after that. I'm gonna go talk to my staff. I'm gonna go implement these things. Um, my approach here on the e-commerce um, e and eye care is, is a little bit different. I wanna talk to you guys about what are like the foundational things we need to have in place to be a player in e-commerce? What is our mindset if we are trying to get into e-commerce? And then, you know, I like to talk a lot about branding and, um, you know, positioning ourselves digitally to make sure we can, you know, take advantage of the platforms that are available to us. So we're gonna take that sort of a perspective, but uh, and also talk to you about some real life examples that have happened within our office that have been uh, really great for us um, and beneficial, obviously revenue wise, building the practice. I love this image, and uh, I think just a little earlier on, someone commented when I, we were doing a little practice session, someone commented that they like this image. I love this image. To me, this really expresses what e-commerce is now, right? It's like the hand and the, the tablet are becoming one, right? And of course, there's dollar signs everywhere. This is what we want to see. Uh, this is, I actually did this talk. Um, uh, I created this talk last year. I'm trying to get my laser pointer up, sorry. Um, and I actually started with a different uh, cover, which was this. And so this, uh, you know, I think it makes sense. You're sitting in front of your computer and you're you're doing commerce. But to me, this seems very, this is very 2020, right? Now we're in 2022, and this is this is really what e-commerce is like now. And we're going to talk more about that, and then the digital and the physical coming together, and what that really means. But this is what it used to feel like. I'm going to click a couple of buttons, and then it's going to go somewhere. And then a truck is going to come and deliver something to my house. Uh, you know, that's the old version of e-commerce in my mind. Um, and kind of the version that we have to shift away from when we're thinking about getting more involved in it now. Hey, Herbie, Herbie quick comment. Uh, you're sharing your notes as well. Uh, oh, well the actual, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Give me a second. Yeah. I think you're on the wrong slide. So when you do your share screen, just share a portion of your screen. Yeah. So when you pick here, which here, one I you want to select. Up here, one second. This is after we practice too. So <laughs> I, thought, I thought here I'm doing a talk about like digital and e commerce. And <laughs> there we okay. go. Perfect, perfect, perfect. <laughs> Let me get, okay. So, did you guys, um, you see what I was talking about, right? So, this is the, the slide that I use now as my cover. This is the old one. This is very like last year. Um, and I feel like we got to talk a little bit more about how integrated things are. Uh, some disclosures. So a little bit about me. Um, I'm an optometrist. I'm co-owner in two practices. One is a sublease practice next door to a lens crafters. The other one is a private practice, independent optometry practice. Um, this is pretty much what I look like at work every day, um, like to try to make it fun and, and lighthearted. Um, as Aaron mentioned, I have a big passion for giving back. Uh, I like to volunteer. I've done a couple of these uh, volunteer trips uh, globally. Um, and a little bit of shameless self-promotion. I also have a podcast. It's called the 2020 Podcast. And you can find it wherever you find all your favorite podcasts, Apple, Spotify, YouTube, and all those places. And I like to bring on people who, within the optical industry and outside of it, people who can inspire us and share their stories and challenges and help us see outside of the box, help us see the bigger picture. Um, I've had some amazing you know, business people, entrepreneurs, um, high-level athletes, all these types of people. And of course, people from within the industry as well. Um, and that 
is is really important actually the the reason i started the, the time that the podcast came to fruition i was doing another thing which is actually the most relevant thing for this talk which is i had started my own e-commerce eyewear brand back in 2017 called oxford and kin and when i say i started my it was a lot like what um is it natasha sorry from 1284 was talking about right i I had started to actually design and work with the manufacturers and I built my own e-commerce platform and I was doing all the social media and I was marketing and networking and I was head of logistics, right? I was packaging and, and going, working deals with the labs, all these things for this standalone e-commerce brand. So I did that for about five years. And, uh, you know, fortunately last year I was able to, um, it was acquired by another bigger company. So I was able to exit or still kind of involved, but um, you know, had the opportunity to exit after having all of these crazy experiences. And I want to share some of those in insights with you guys today as well, um, because we have to decide, and we're going to talk a bit more about this. What type of e-commerce are we trying to play in here? Are we trying to do Oxford and Ken? Are we trying to have a standalone e-commerce brand? Or are we trying to extend the reach of our, of our current practice and our current business and, and reach more people? So that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to start with some of the stats, I'm gonna give you some stats about global uh, usage and search and stats like that and, and behaviors. And then we're gonna talk about what are the foundations of building an e-commerce brand or getting into e-commerce. We'll talk about some of the trends. Uh, where are we going with e-commerce? Why is it different today? Like I changed that, that cover image. Why is it different today than it was last year? And then again, branding, I think is gonna be a very important part of this discussion. And you're gonna hear me talk about some of the stuff that you've heard, you heard from Brianna, you heard from, um, Roya 1284, a lot of these things really integrate into the type of stuff I want to talk to you about. So first, the disruption. Okay, so I mean, we'd like to think about eye care kind of got disrupted, what, 10 or 12 years ago. But really, e-commerce has been around and, and all industries have been being disrupted for what, like 30 years? Amazon is, uh, was um, founded in like mid nineties, Netflix was like the late nineties, you know, so it's been 25, 30 years for some of these companies. It was bound to happen in our industry too, especially when you think about, you know, the inefficiency of the supply, supply chains, the fat margins, the poor consumer understanding of the pricing. This is essentially, I'm like taking all the things off of Warby's website, right? About why they're, they're a good brand to shop with, but it's the truth. And Warby came in and here and actually in Vancouver clearly was the big one back in like 09. They really caused a true disruption and deregulation in our in our province. And, you know, all these other players have come in and then we kind of got like, oh, no, we got to do something about this. But back then there were very few tools at our disposal to actually get into the game. Now you hear from Roya 1284, you hear from these other companies uh, about how we have these tools and solutions right at our fingertips. We can play in the same game pretty much as all these big guys. And of course, the thing that Again, Brianna mentioned in her presentation that sped, sped everything up, that giant wrecking ball was COVID, right? Now, all of a sudden, everyone's scrambling, like, how do I get online? Because I got no business through my office. So let's talk about some of the stats. I think this is just important for us to kind of understand what is happening, what are the behaviors, where are people um, like living, you know, in the digital world? Uh, these stats are from Hootsuite. They put out this amazing global overview every year. Uh, you're going to see some black slides and some white ones. The white ones are from last year, but the numbers are still very relevant. Um, here, the key one is, you know, of course, we know the population and so on. A lot of people on social media, right? More than half the world's population is on social media. Um, and out of that, the big one here for me is the last one. Again, 98, pretty much 100 percent of people are act, accessing social media through mobile. And you're gonna hear me say this over and over, mobile, mobile, mobile. Uh, again, hence that new cover photo on the, on the presentation. And it seems obvious, right? Of course, we go to Instagram on our phone, we go to LinkedIn on our phone, but go back not that long ago, just about 10 years, everything was through our computer. We were going on Facebook and so on before LinkedIn was really big, or excuse me, Instagram was really big. We were accessing it through our computers, but now, People literally, as we know, have the world at their fingertips in our hands. So we have to remember that when we're talking about getting into e-commerce and reaching people out in the digital world, a lot of that's gonna happen in the palm of their hands. So that's where we have to find ourselves. Online search behaviors, really important when we're thinking about how we are going to be found. So obviously people use conventional search engines, right? 
But I'm really, really intrigued by, I think it's super cool that people are using voice, people are using um, image recognition, and of course they're using social media to search, to find the brands, to find the companies, to review us, the practitioners, uh, before they even come in to get services from us, right? But how many people now are like, hey Siri, where can I get a, or hey Google, what's this about? You know, that's the, uh, the voice search is huge and it's only getting bigger. We're gonna break down some of these stats a little bit more here. So again, different types of search. This is sort of by age, you know, how many people are searching online before they go make a purchase, uh, before they go find a, a service online. I love this one. Excuse me. Um, breaking down ver social media searches versus search engine searches. And if you look at the youngest group here, there's more, they're searching more via social media than they are through traditional search engines. So when, again, when you think about being present online and trying to create some sort of an e-commerce presence, we gotta be on social media. We have to meet our consumers where they are. It's very, very important to, to build that presence. And again, most people are using social media through uh, mobile. So we gotta be present on mobile. So e-commerce activities, you know, a lot of the same kind of stuff. People are searching online before they visit any store, uh, go in store. Uh, they're searching, they're purchasing on a mobile device or on a tablet. And there's a lot of people who are buying online. This is uh, in the past month. We go to the next slide. This shows weekly, there's, you know, 60% of people are buying something online weekly. I mean, Amazon or whatever it is, people are buying online. We know that people are there and they're ready to do it. And then this is... Uh, e-commerce purchases via mobile. So again, this slide, this is why I brought this slide in. Everything is mobile, 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 right? We got to be present there. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that, but understanding that if we're trying to do e-commerce, it's not somebody sitting in front of their computer searching and trying to, you know, purchase something it's happening in the palm of their hands. So let's talk about the fundamentals. All right, again, I think sometimes we get a little excited about how can I get into e-commerce? What technologies can I use? But what are the fundamentals? We have to have these in place before we can try to explore any other more extravagant options. All right, and the number one thing, which is probably the most boring thing, but most important, I think Roya would agree, is the website. Okay, if you don't have a good website, none of the other stuff's gonna work. Everything comes through your website and goes from your website. We're going to talk about what, an impo what important features we want to see in our website. And of course, you want to build good SEO through that website so people can find you. What good is having an online store if people are not finding you online? And then marketing. And when I say marketing, I mean traditional forms of marketing, not paid, I should say, maybe organic. So you could talk about sending out uh, flyers. You could talk about advertising um, on social media or social media posts, things like that, that you're doing to build your presence online. And then of course, paid ads, uh, Facebook, Google, these things are all gonna be very important, but it all starts from building your website first. So what are the key features for a strong website? Some of the things you've already heard about. For me, you've heard about 10 times already. It has to be mobile friendly. I was talking to, you know, I did, I did a series of marketing podcasts on my uh, episodes on my podcast and talking to experts in this, field, the number one thing they kept saying over and over was it has to be mobile friendly, not simply for the sake, sake of user interact, uh, uh, the user interface and user experience, but because Google actually prioritizes that when you're search, when it's searching, when it's crawling websites, is this website mobile friendly, it's going to rank it higher. So it's not just about user experience, it's actually about showing up in front of people. So when people find you and they come on your website, what are they going to see? They're going to see a beautiful website. But are they just going to see that you carry certain brands? And I think Brie was mentioning this in her, um, in her presentation as well. Like, are you going to have a little lit logo that says Gucci? And then when they click that, they're going to go to the Gucci website. Or are you going to have a logo that says Gucci? And when they click that, they're going to see all the Gucci frames that you carry in your store. Wouldn't that be a lot better? That makes a lot more sense to me. So that's the natural step. They come on your website. They see what brand you carry. They see what models of each brand you carry. And then what's the next natural step? Again, we've heard about it already. We want them to be able to try it on, right? Virtual try-ons, 
this used to seem like some crazy futuristic thing that only the big corps with lots of money could put on their websites. But now we have access to this and really high end, really advanced, really, uh, you know, well played, excuse me, good user interface um, products that we can implement into our own website. So when somebody comes on your website, they see the product that they like, now they can try it on. Maybe they want it in a different color, but you don't have it, but they could try it on and say, hey, I want it in this color and you can order it for them. So virtual try on really big, really important. Now, these are becoming standards for what we need to have on our website if we want to be playing online, right? It's no longer like some fancy thing that we could potentially have in the future. It's here now. And we all know the value of telehealth, um, but using telehealth, again, integrated into your own website or into your own app even, versus the patient having to go onto Zoom or, or Doxy or some other platform to meet you online, having it streamlined straight through your own website. Because when it's done there, one, it builds your brand, it keeps people right there in front of you, it keeps you right in front of them, but it's also a channel for sales. Okay, this is another form of e-commerce that maybe we don't think of as e-commerce. When I'm talking to a patient about um, whatever, they have dry eyes via a virtual consult, I can drag and drop the product I want them to use into the chat and they can click and buy it right there and then, right? Buy these eye drops, buy this heat mask, whatever it might be. It can happen right there and then, save the trouble of the patient going anywhere else or searching anywhere else to buy those products. So we, it's not just glasses and contact lenses, it's these dry eye products and other types of services that we can offer. So I think to me, this is, again, just a, a year ago, this sounded kind of futuristic as far as what a website should look like, but now it's becoming like what we should have for a good functioning website that's gonna get into doing online sales. What is our goal? This is really important for us when we start to get revved up about how we wanna get online and you know build an online uh, platform and make sales online. So when I was building Oxford and Ken, I learned a lot of difficult lessons as anybody else who, who's tried to build an e-commerce brand kind of stand alone like that. And one of them is like, are you tr really trying to compete with the big players? Are we really trying to compete with Warby and Zenny and these other companies? Is that, does that really make sense to do that even? Or are we trying to extend what we already have as far as our physical brick and mortar business and grow it and reach more um, patients within our demographic and, and people who are already sort of within our sphere. It's important to distinguish that. Maybe you do wanna go up against the big boys and, and you got the funding and you got everything you need. Awesome, good. But I'll say from my experience, it's actually probably more valuable to build a small niche if you're gonna do the standalone thing, a small niche brand that's gonna really speak to a small group of people who will be loyal to you and they'll come back to you and buy from you over and over versus trying to be something for everybody. That's really hard to do that as we know. But also creating that online platform that's just there for our existing patients to be able to reach us. Like Rihanna was saying in her presentation about the mom who's feeding her baby in the middle of the night and wants to buy, buy a eye drops or renew her contacts or whatever it is. We have to be there for those people. And I think really that's gonna be the biggest source of our revenue is those patients who want to be just do the things in the middle of the night, like me, to be honest, I'm the guy who comes home, gets the kids to bed at 9 p.m. I'm like, all right, I forgot I got to buy this thing. Now, where can I buy it? OK, and that's a really important thing for us to, to make sure we're uh, we're confident in that decision ahead of time. And do we want to build our own standalone store by ourselves? Trust me, I've gone through that process. It's painful. It takes a really long time. And we now have the resources and solutions available to us where companies can build these stores for us, brand them for us with our company name, our logo and everything on it. And we have to understand the cost of customer acquisition. We used to say that, oh, like Facebook ads are super cheap and it's really easy to run ads and, and get people, but it's getting more and more difficult with the iOS updates. It's harder to, we don't have the, the detailed uh, targeting ability that we thought we used to have. We thought we used to have, I don't know if we actually used to have it, but we used to think that we could go and pinpoint an ad to a 45 year old woman who has three kids, two of them are girls, one of them is a boy and they went to the zoo last week and they specifically spent more time looking at the monkeys. But I don't know if we can do it. And, and with the new iOS ESA update, actually you can't do that anymore anyway. So not only with that and with the fact that the 
there, there's no barrier to entry. There's so many people trying to be online and, and advertise online and market online that so many people are using the same search terms. It's actually becoming more and more expensive and more and more difficult. So in my opinion, getting an expert to help you with this part of it, to do the Facebook ads, the Google ads, these things are all really important when we're trying to get out there and gain new customers. Sorry, I'm like super thirsty this morning. Screaming at Dave Chappelle last night. I think I kind of lost my voice a little bit. Um, okay, so let's talk about, um, that's where we're at. Okay, we know the stats currently, we know where people are living online, what their search behaviors are, what their e-commerce behaviors are. We know what our foundations are now, what we need to have in place so we can reach those people. But what are the trends moving forward? As I mentioned, things are changing and they're changing dramatically. I actually had to update a lot in this presentation just from six months ago, maybe even less. And so I think it's really important to know what the trends are now moving forward. And this, what I have here is some research I was doing into um, some big uh, firms like Havas, uh, Hootsuite, even Shopify releases a report every year on what they think the e-commerce trends are. I kind of compiled it, condensed it into four points here that we're going to talk about. And the number one thing that comes up across the board with all of these companies is that we need to create an immersive experience. No longer is it, here is my online store, go buy from me over there. Now it's, here's my online store and it's integrated with my in-store experience. We have to create an immersive experience. Again, that tablet with the fingers and everything's kind of blending into one. That's actually what patients want. They want to go online. They want to do the virtual try-on. And then they want to come into the store and see that exact same frame. So how about they go do the virtual try on, you save, you see that in their account, they've tried that frame on. In the store, you put that frame aside. So when they come in, boom, it's there for them to put on. And vice versa. They come into the store, they try the frame on, you say, you know what? I'm gonna put this into your digital locker. So when you go home, you can go onto the website and it's right there for you to check out again and you can do another virtual try on and you can click buy online uh, right there from the comfort of your own home. Blending all of that together, be, making it as seamless as possible is really what we need to look at as what e-commerce is going to be for us in eye care. The second thing that was really, really a common denominator across all of these firms and all the people I'm marketing people I'm speaking to is a corporate purpose. And this is not new. I feel like this has been, again, I, when I started Oxford and Ken, 2016 is when I really started to do the work on it. I knew this is something that I thought was obvious to me. And so when I started the brand from day one, I actually reached out to um, a, a foundation called Op Optometry Giving Site. I'm sure there's people on, on the call who've heard of it before. Um, and they do a lot of fundraising and charitable work to build schools in, in um, developing countries and they provide services, eye related services. And so I actually built from day one, I called them, we built a relationship. You know, every percentage or dollars from a sale goes to OGS. And that was huge for the brand. Like people, people clung on to that much more tightly than I thought they were going to. People were buying from Oxford and Ken because specifically they give back. And people want that story, right? So selling just Ray-Ban, um, you know, not to say anything negative about Ray-Ban, but like just because it's a big brand name, just for the sake of selling Ray-Ban is like everybody does that on every street corner. What kind of purpose are we integrating into our brand, into our store, into our online? Uh, presence that's going to make a, a patient, potential patient and customer say, these guys are doing something good. They are they care about sustainability. They care about the environment. They care about giving back, whatever it might be, that's going to want them to come back to you and pick you over some other brand. And online in particular, this is really important, but we can this will easily translate into stuff that we're doing in our office. We can easily create these partnerships as well. So customer care was another big one. Meeting people where they are is so huge. And Brianna talked about, I keep referencing Brianna's presentation. I guess she just covered all the bases for me. Good job, Bri. Um, customer care, she talked about texting people, right? We're doing that way more now. That's where people are responding. Emails just get lost in the, the, the vortex of the inbox. Uh, but text messages, people respond to much more quickly. You know, Those pings really get people's attention so texting, but what about DMing? That's where the younger generation really is living. DMing is, is like, you know, sliding into people's DMs was kind of a grimy thing. Now it's like a legitimate way to do business. 
with again with Oxford and Kin, that's where I did a lot of like my customer care. I had to email up on the website. No, like very few people emailed me. Most people were finding me through social media, through our branding, through our you know promotional stuff with influencers that we were doing, and then they would DM me on on our Instagram, and that's where I was talking to them. We can do that with our with our eye care business as well. In fact, I do that through our High Street Eye Care and our Clarity Eye Care um, social media. Not that we have massive audience. We don't need to. That's something else we'll talk about. But knowing that that's where people are, that's where they want to connect. Um, when we do an influencer campaign on our High Street or Clarity, uh, you know, for dry eye or for aesthetics, that's where people message. Hey, I saw XYZ influencer got this treatment. What does it cost? How does it work? I'm like spending hours on there just sending these messages to people. That's where they want to be. So let's think about connecting with them there. And people do, companies do a lot of business through DMs, whether it's through, you know, bots and automation, or even if it's just like you're, you're there physically having that conversation yourself, um, dragging and dropping or, or linking products into there or making appointments through there so people can come in and see you. Um, DMs are a great place to connect with people. The last common trend that I saw across all of these different firms and their reports was that there's a lot of social cynicism for big brands. And I think this is, makes sense. I guess this is not new. It's also something I was feeling over the last few years with Oxford and Ken. People are skeptical of the big brands and you know the, the, the sort of ominous presence that big brands have. And we're well aware of, of, of brands in our own industry that have that presence. They're cynical of that. So why can't why don't we take advantage of that? Being the small guy, being the 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 small guy with a purpose, it's more advantageous than it's ever been, and that's what is going to lead me into the next part of the conversation, which is about branding. How do you position yourself in front of these potential patients and customers so they see you as that that brand and that company with a purpose that specializes that means something versus just some Joe Blow. Uh, optical that's selling all the Luxottica product or whatever big name, big box stuff. So what is a brand? Is it just a logo? Is it just some large institution? Or is it a person? Is it someone's clothing style? Right? A turtleneck and glasses on a stage, you kind of know who that is you know, a fierce, powerful competitor on a tennis court pumping her fist, you kind of know who that's going to be, right? And the Jumpman logo, one of the most iconic. We have the ability to create this presence for ourselves with our customers, with our potential customers and clients. Um, but we don't want to get wrapped up in being the big brand name. And when I was creating this presentation, actually, I did a separate presentation on e um, social media and branding. Um, and I, I remember this clip from the show uh, Entourage. So if you've seen it, you might know this clip, but I want to quickly play this for you. We don't want to get caught up trying to do this. Let me know if the audio doesn't play. Mercedes. Coca-Cola. Two of the most recognizable names on the planet. Vincent Chase. We intend to make you as popular as both of them. Canon. Vincent Chase. Microsoft. McDonald's. Vincent Chase. Brand name recognition. What do you think? I think I need to think. Vince. It's pathetic, Ari. That's pathetic, Ari. You could do better than that. We're not trying to be the big brand names. We're not, we want to go beyond branding. We want to go beyond just being a, a logo that our, our customers and our patients recognize. I like this term even better. We want to become a, a love mark and you know, try to get your mind out of the gutter here. We're not trying to leave love marks. We're trying to be a love mark. Um, Kevin, uh, Kevin Roberts, who was the CEO of Saatchi and Saatchi, one of the biggest marketing agencies in the world, uh, came up with this. And this is a great book. If you're into branding and marketing, this is a fantastic book. That episode uh, from Entourage is from 06, 05, 06. This book is from 05. And it's just as relevant 17 years later uh, as it was back then, right? We don't want to be on the bottom left of this 
uh, these at this axis, the low love, low respect. We want to be high love, high respect. We want to be have staying power. We want people to keep coming back to us. Because if you remember, I was saying earlier, customer ac customer acquisition is more expensive than it's ever been. Having our own patients come back to us is more valuable than it's ever been. Having them to be as loyal with, to us as possible has been is more valuable than it's ever been. So branding, to me, when we're talking about being on being out there on digital platforms and building an e-commerce platform, branding is actually a huge key for me. Once we got those foundations in place, let's talk about how we're going to brand ourselves to be that person, that company that customers want to keep going to. When they're sitting at home, they can go to Amazon or wherever, wherever, but they want to come back to see Dr. XYZ because they love them and they love what they're doing. So I have what I call my three pillars of branding. And this, this goes for online branding, digital branding. It also goes for offline uh, networking and making connections as well. The number one thing you want to do is provide value. Provide value. Value means different things to different people. It could mean educating. It could mean making people laugh. It could mean building some other form of a relationship. But when someone leaves that interaction, they leave feeling like they gained something uh, versus having given something away. And that goes for, again, meeting people in person. When you have a conversation with them, try to leave them better than when you met them. But online, it means not just advertising and promoting and being up in people's faces. It means giving them value, educating them, showing them what they need to know so they can they want to keep coming back to you as the resource for that information. The second thing is engagement. And engagement means a couple of different things. It, online, it means when someone leaves a comment or a review, you make sure you respond. Even a bad review, you respond. Okay, you got to make sure you're always connecting and responding to people online. The other part of engagement is actually going out of your way to connect with people. And I'm going to show you something that I did that really worked well and continues to work well in our office when it comes to social media. And Again, resulting in that immersive experience, resulting in revenue for our business, engaging, going out of your way to connect with people online, leaving comments on posts, entering, interjecting yourself into conversations that are already happening. That's engagement. And then consistency is, is maybe the most important thing. We know consistency is key in all facets of any kind of digital branding and marketing. You've got to be there consistently over and over, the same voice, same, same tone, the same level of education, you know, making sure that people know that when you when they see Harbir, he's going to be talking about this. He's going to be bringing this type of level of education or, or energy or excitement or whatever it is. And then carrying that across different platforms, Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, all the same message. So no matter where someone sees you, they're going to get the same value and the same branding. So this obviously, you know, based on the little image on the on the right here, this carries over into social media. But social media is not what a lot of people think social media is, right? A lot of times when I tell people I'm into social media, I spend a lot of time on it. They're, they just think I spend time scrolling through pictures and liking and like, oh my God, Kim Kardashian did this thing. I don't do that. I use social media as a tool. Yes, I comment on a lot of people's stuff. That's a strategy. Yes, I post a lot. That's a strategy. That's a way of building my brand, my personal brand, and also a way to build the brand of my clinics so people will come in and... Um, want to have their services from us. Social media is not just a tool to post pictures and look pretty. It's a place where, as we talked about, people go for research. It's a place that people go for education, huge. I mean, how many people go to TikTok to learn recipes and strategies and, and like cleaning up and whatever it's called, organizational stuff? It's insane. And it's definitely a place for sales. I already touched on DMs, but what about live streaming sales? You see that these pictures, all three of them that I have here are examples of different platforms where people are doing sales like the lady on the right is trying on a dress and saying here's the dress here's what it looks like drops a link in the chat this is what the dress is this is how much it costs you know you can preview it whatever you buy it right there and then streaming sales live streaming sales are huge now billions and billions of dollars probably close to trillions i would imagine um, in sales from these live streaming um, platforms so this is an avenue for us to explore as well Instead of doing a trunk show, what if we did a live streaming trunk show with an influencer? We had a, an influencer come in and say, okay, today, so-and-so is going to try on the, all the new, you know, 1284 stuff that we just brought in, okay? 
and she tries it on. Here it is. What do you guys think? Here's a link if you want to buy it right now. If you buy it right now, you get it for this discount. You can come in. We can talk about lenses or whatever later. Okay, here's the next frame. That is where it's going. If it's not already there, if you're doing that already, incredible, good for you. But that's what we have to look at as far as using social media. This is e-commerce, right? I don't know if you guys think of this as e-commerce, but this is, again, bringing all these things together. And I've said the word influencers a bunch of times. I actually don't really like the word influencer, but I don't know of a better word. So I just keep using it. Influencers are, can be really, really valuable if you know which ones to use. And that's the hard part, okay? Nano or micro, those are the terms you may have heard already. People who have smaller followings, five to 10 to 15,000, but are really, really engaged with their community and their audience. They get crazy amounts of engagement. Their audience really relies on them for input and style or whatever industry they're in. And those people are out there. And I've been working with a couple of them through our offices, a um, couple of them through Oxford and Kin. Uh, and there's one girl locally here who literally has blown everybody out of the water. I've worked with so many influencers through Oxford and Kin, some of them like with a million followers and I get zero sales practically. Right. And others, you know, 100,000 followers, maybe we get 10 sales, whatever, whatever. Uh, this girl has about 50K on Instagram. And she would just post something in passing um, that she'd be wearing the Oxford and Kin frame. She'd be talking about something totally different, but then she would just write in the on the stories. Like if anybody's on Instagram, you know, the stories that kind of just float by real quick, just in stories, not even like a static post. She would just tag Oxford and Kin glasses from Oxford and Kin. We would get 10 sales from that that day. Like, and then when she ever did like a more like dedicated post, obviously different. Um, and it's just incredible how valuable influencers can be in driving sales. And this is valuable to us. So finding somebody in your market, in your demographic, in your geographical location, who can come in and specifically talk about what your office does. And if you offer specialty services, dry eye, aesthetics, um, myopia control, like if you get a mom blogger, talk about myopia control, but specifically talking about your doctors and your office can be super valuable and you can get a lot of sales through that. And I wanna give you one very, very specific example um, of a couple of ladies that we work with through our um, High Street Eye Care location, actually ended up being through both offices. So it started with, um, it started with this post. This lady's name is Laurel. And she's one half of a sister duo bloggers. They're the Sugar Plum Sisters. And they're, they're great. There's like, again, on Instagram, smaller 5,000, 6,000 followers, but their blog gets a lot of traction. And, you know, they, they have their audiences is, is, looks like them, like women in their sort of 40s and 50s um, who want to keep up with style. They're outgoing. So um, Laurel posted this picture. And she, she was actually talking about the fact that she needs to dye her hair now, right? She's kind of in her early to mid forties. But what she realized after she took the picture is that her readers were on her head. And so instead of taking another picture, she decided to lean into it. And she wrote on her post that, um, well, this is also what I have to do now. I'm not only getting my hair dyed, I gotta wear my readers everywhere I go. So I decided to, I saw this post, I decided to jump in, I said, Hey, Laurel, first of all, you look fantastic. Second, we got to get you into some multifocal contact lenses. Okay. I interjected myself into this conversation and within a couple of weeks, like she messaged me, we started talking and within a couple of weeks, she came into the office and we got her fitted into multifocals and she was posting about it on her social media about how fantastic the experience was um, and how happy she was and, you know, your supply, but because she was posting it, Within the first month or two, we had a dozen or more new patients come in who specifically said, I saw Laurel talking about these multifocal contacts. I don't want to have to wear my glasses when I'm out and about and doing these things. Okay, that was, that was instant and it was very tangible. A lot of times with social media, it's hard to know, uh, did that really work? But when you do this kind of stuff, a lot of times it's very easy to track because people will be very straight up. I saw it on social media. I saw XYZ person doing it. And it didn't stop there. So from there, we got... Laurel's sister, Pam, to come in and also get multifocal contacts. But when Pam started wearing her contacts, um, she started to realize her eyes felt dry. So we talked about, okay, Pam, we got to get you doing some warm compresses and omega-3s and using some good high quality uh, artificial tears. And that helped, but she's like, I really want to 
get rid of this whole thing. And we were talking about the fact that we do advanced dry eye treatments. Well, then of course, Pam signed up for the whole shebang. We got her doing RF and IPL. And after we did about four or five treatments of RF, she's like, hey, yeah, I can see that uh, my eyes like just look brighter. How many more treatments if I want to like really get rid of the wrinkles? I don't know, maybe another four treatments, Pam. Great, sign me up. Okay, so now Pam's been posting about this and we've been getting people coming in. Just the other day, I had the, a lady come and plop herself down in the exam chair. I hear you're the dry eye wizard. I was like, really? I haven't really advertised myself as that. But uh, she's like, no, Pam told me or I saw on Pam's social media that you do. So here I am, let's do it. And like people are very direct. Just a year or so ago, people would be like kind of sheepish. Oh, you know, I heard about this treatment RF. I've just heard it from it somewhere. I don't know. Now they'll be like, oh, Pam said it. You know, she said it's great. I want to get it done. So social media, super powerful. It's becoming more and more powerful and actually very tangible place to do commerce, to get sales, to get revenue. Okay, let's take it a step further into a place that I feel like a lot of people get uncomfortable these days. How many people have heard the word metaverse or the term NFT in the past year? <laughs> Probably everyone, right? Wow, this NFT sold for $5 billion. This picture of a duck smoking a cigarette or something, who knows? I, like, it's just absurd, okay? But there's actual utility and, 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 and um, value in talking about NFTs and the metaverse. Maybe a little bit early, but it's not that early. That's all I really want to bring, on, bring to you guys here is like looking forward. This is going to be something that we want to go into. And, you, you know, there's some really cool people within the optical space already, um, you know, kind of exploring it, building something, trying to build something within the metaverse. But first, let's talk about what is the metaverse, right? Often, I, anytime I talk to someone about the metaverse, they think avatars walking around in a virtual world. You know, you've got the goggles on and, you know, you're... you're secluded from all actual human uh, life. But really, this the metaverse is really just uh, an intersection of the physical and the digital world. Again, that fingers on the tablet thing, right? This is, this is the metaverse, what we're doing right now. This is, in a sense, we're mixing digital and physical worlds and bringing them together. But there's some really exciting things that can come from this as far as we're talking e-commerce, the ability to sell, um, digital assets like NFTs and have them have real world uh, implications. Uh, it's a really cool concept. So the, there's one company uh, that you might have seen or heard of called Monocle. Not trying to do a promotional thing. It's just something that I know this is a company that I know is doing stuff and I think is, is kind of cool. So their idea is you go into the metaverse and you design your own frame and you have a digital token that's your NFT. You have the digital version of the frames like this one that's spinning around here. Okay. But then you get, uh, for that digital token, you get to get a, a, a pair of physical glasses that match the style of the glasses that you've just made. Okay, so that's your, that's your physical portion of that NFT. And then what we can do to that is then tie future benefits to have owning that digital token. So we sell this NFT, the patient gets the digital glasses that their avatar can wear. They get a pair of physical glasses they can wear in the real world. And then the NFT has this future value that says, next time we do a big product drop, next time we do a big trunk show or whatever it might be, you get 20% off, 30% off, 50% off, whatever it might be. You assign some value to that NFT for the future. So it holds its value. So it's not like I just spent $1,000 on this digital token and now it's not worth anything because I got my glasses, end of story. You know, other companies are... are providing behind the scenes or, or restricted access to events or whatever it might be. And we have ability to do all of these things as well. So just keeping in mind that this is something that's coming. Don't get discouraged or scared or whatever about it. Just kind of be open to it and understand that this is going to be a place that we're going to want to play in and just learn about it. Okay, so let's wrap up here with our game plan. What's the number one thing we need to do to get out there and be involved and have some sort of an e-commerce presence? The number one thing is you got to have a fantastic website. Okay. Everything starts there. Sounds boring, but you have to have that. It's just non-negotiable anymore, right? You can't have one of these basic looking websites where it's more like just text and it's not interactive and it's not beautiful. You got to have that without question. 
The second thing is then the marketing and the ads. So again, clumping those two together now, doing the more traditional forms of marketing, but doing the paid advertising and likely finding a company to do it for you, an expert to do it for you is going to be really important. So you keep your cost of acquisition low. The third thing is the social media and the branding part that we just spent some time on. I think this is going to be huge for us. If we get comfortable getting in front of the camera, get, in, get comfortable engaging with our audience, learn how we can utilize and, and leverage influencers, we can really bring people in and start to make more sales online. And finally, um, I know Danny was talking about this with, with uh, Roya. This is, is vital, right? And I know that a lot of us are good at this. We're talking to ODs on finance here. I know you guys are uh, all about the numbers. Tracking re your results is so important. Obviously, not just to make sure you know what you know, you know what's working, you know what's not working, so you can make changes and keep improving. Thank you. I used the same image that I stopped using in the beginning, but here it is. Uh, please connect with me. I'd be happy to chat with you. Instagram is probably the place you'll find me the most. Um, drop me a DM. Let's chat. Awesome, Javier. Thank you for a great presentation. That was fantastic, and a lot of good info. A lot of ways to open up our minds to new things and futuristic things so fantastic all right and we're going to go ahead and jump ahead and we have another intermission so another bio break for everyone before we jump into the last presentation with walt whitley uh, so before we do that i want to introduce our diamond sponsor for today and that is optify optify is a fantastic way to get patients into your practice, to allow them to browse frames before they visit your practice and then have an idea of what they're gonna buy when they come in. And it kind of ties in directly with Rivera's lecture. So I'm gonna pass it over to Jen to talk a little bit more about Optify. Or is it Dave? It's Dave. Just Dave, okay. <laughs> yeah, it's Dave. Dave is gonna talk more about Optify. Jen or Dave can talk about it. <laughs> I'll jump in. <laughs> So um, yeah, that was an awesome presentation. I think our product really um, adds to that. Uh, we someday, I hope we're selling virtual glasses to your patients in the metaverse, but right now we're gonna focus on in real life, like how to do it. And a lot of times it starts on digital. My background, um, I've been in the optical industry for 18 years. Half of that time has been selling people glasses online and high-end glasses. So not the cheap stuff, $450 average order value or higher glasses, you know, average order value glasses. So good quality glasses online. I could tell you it is very hard to make money in a pure e-commerce play, very hard. The real opportunity is with Omnichannel. And the good news is you all are more than halfway there because you have a brick and mortar. So you just layer in some digital on top of that and you can get a lot more out of your business. So you've already done the hardest part. Um, a successful practice once told me that um, when somebody takes out their insurance card, they're a patient. When they take out their uh, credit card, they're a customer. And we are selling not just a medical device, but a fashion item to these patients. So we just got to really think about like, think about that. So let me share my screen here. So we help you turn your patients into loyal eyewear shoppers. 44% of your patients um, are already using the internet to research eyewear. This is from the Vision Council. I think this is pre-pandemic. I'm pretty sure this number is actually higher now. So they're already online, they're already looking. So why does your site send them away? These logo pages just send patients away. It's the digital equivalent of asking them to walk across the street, pick out some glasses, and when they're ready to buy, come back in and buy them from you. They need to be able to interact with your site. You've got them there. Let them do stuff on your website. That's super important. You need to make it easier for patients to buy your glasses from you. They will buy their glasses from you if you show them what they can buy in your practice. More of them will. So unless you have a 100% capture rate, and I've never come across a practice uh, with that yet, uh, there's more that you could do. And they can buy more glasses from you if you let them interact with the products and show them the um, discounts and things that you can provide. And they'll buy faster from you if you let them participate in their purchase experience. And this is great for your staff too, because it frees up staff time. So how? You need to connect their purchase with your practice. It's logical, it works, and it starts online. This is important because this is the national average, 37% of independent practice revenue uh, comes from glasses and lenses. It's the largest category in independent optometry. Healthy practices, this number is a lot higher. So it's something that we need to focus on. So stop sending your eyewear shoppers away. Let them browse and shop on your site. So put a button on your site that lets them shop. 
that takes them to not a logo page that sends them off your site through a Google search, but to a rich, immersive browsing and shopping experience. And this is what Optify builds right here. So patients can browse, sort, click, dig in, um, do an in-office try-on, favorite frames, request in-office try-on. They can buy online. They can get a price quote. Everybody, including your patients, know they don't pay that price. It's listed on the site. It's a quote-based system that happens in the practice. And uh, they can virtually try on as well. And you need a really cool admin dashboard that allows your staff and yourself to see if it's working. So there's no worse use of money than, uh, sending, than, than building a website that nobody goes to. But you don't have time to take pictures. You're not going to do this at lunch. And you can't spend all day sending marketing messages to each individual patient that is in a different spot in their buying journey. So use automations instead. So we connect your practice management system to a massive product catalog, 300,000 images, 750 brands, tons of independence. You're not taking pictures. We automatically sync that inventory every day through our EHR connections. And we automate those marketing sends as well when the patient is most likely to come in and buy. This is how it works. Patient receives two days before their exam a pre-shop message to browse your site, pick out frames to try on. They're participating in their purchase. They're more likely to buy. They're more likely to buy more and they'll move through the practice faster. Your staff will love this. And then walkouts. Everybody in the universe is popping something up on a web page, trying to get your patient's attention, trying to sell them something if they have a brand new prescription in hand. Everybody except their optometrist. So you need to automate those messages, send them to your patients, keep them engaged with you. And then multiple pairs. The best time to sell another pair of glasses is about three weeks after the first uh, pair is purchased. We're not optimized to do that. We need to send marketing automations to those patients, get them uh, into onto your website, let them browse your site and pick out another pair of glasses and utilize their discounts that are still available to them. And you'll sell more pairs of glasses to them. So results, safe, safe to have time, about 15 minutes uh, per patient that uses this. This is hours a day. Increase the capture rate by about five to 15% and average optical order value by about 5%. So there's true ROI here. We see a 10X or more um, return on investment opportunity by just doing these things. And we have a special deal with uh, ODs on finance today. Uh, our pricing starts at 249 a month for everything. Uh, we're giving a $500 discount today for onboarding. So that brings it down to $1,000. And uh, we are including free virtual try-on for all of our accounts, if you're even a current account, it goes retroactive and we're adding virtual try to your site. So get your optical online. There's never been a better time. I think uh, um, Harbeer's presentation proved that. Just remove those dead ends. Keep your patients buying from you. It's extremely important. So thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you, Dave. Yeah, definitely check out Optify. Fantastic tech. And it's been a great thing. I mean, Brianna just said right there, she added it to our, her practice and it's Worked fantastic. And here is the QR code. So if you want to jump right on that, take advantage of that deal because that is a really good deal. And that was something that we worked hard to get everyone. Uh, Julie, of course, was involved in that as always. <laughs> and then before I jump into our last sponsor, I want to ask a quick question here. So we've had a lot of good ideas, uh, whether it came from Brianna or Harbeer or some of the sponsors. So what is one tech idea you're either going to learn more about or actually implement in your practice? I want you to put that in the chat if you can. And it can be anything, anything that you saw today. I just want to kind of hear from the audience. So what are you getting from this? What, what are you learning from this? And what do you want to implement? I just think it'd be really good to know that. And with that being said, we're going to jump to our last sponsor before we jump into our last lecture. And that is Perry Brill with Entrepreneur and Optical Sus. So Perry, take it away. Or you might need to unmute. There, can you hear me okay? Yeah, you're good. Yeah. All right. Hey, everybody. My name is Perry. And we're talking a lot about efficiencies. And efficiency, I'm going to share with you, is remote staffing. Um, I just posted a poll in my Facebook group. I think, Aaron, it reminded you of a painful time, you said, of staffing your office during COVID. If you have not utilized a remote workforce, you are missing out. And I am making that available to optometry and ophthalmology. I currently have over 20 people uh, working remotely um, in the field. And the way you pay for these remote staff members are they're 1099. So I go out, I hunt them, these qualified people down for you. They're, most of them are based in South Africa. 
and Mexico. We even have bilingual speakers. The best part is a lot of them are opticians and technicians who are working abroad. So when they come into your office and work remotely, they know all the terminology, they can answer most of the questions. Um, and we do it in a really concierge way. So if you've uh, been used other services and you've been disappointed, it may be because uh, you're looking for the lowest paid, lowest morale workers, and we seek to find the highest one. Uh, I officially launched the, this on Friday, but I've been running it in beta for four months with a ton of success. And I hope you uh, join me in getting a remote team member. Stop paying $22 an hour for someone to do data entry, to pull insurance, to answer phones. Uh, you can do it for as little as $15 an hour. Also, um, I have something called Optical Obsessed. It's an optical talk show to increase optical profitability. It's a live talk show. It's every Wednesday and it's staff training. There's no ads. This is not like a webinar. Uh, it's very video based and you'll get to learn from me. I'm an optician by trade and hope to, to see you there. So thanks. Awesome. Thank you, Perry. So make sure to sign up for that talk show. It's fantastic. And yeah, I think you got a great idea going with the, the virtual assistant. So that's fantastic as well. All right, and then scan that QR code if you are interested. And we are going to jump in to our final hour for today. Uh, so this is the final hour of Coke Proof CE. Once again, same guidelines as before. And for this final hour, we've got an awesome speaker here. I'm sure if you've been to a CE course before, you've seen Dr. Walt Whitley. So let me just do a quick introduction for him, and I'm going to pass it over. Oh. Give me one second here. Oh, well, for some reason, your bio disappeared on my phone. <laughs> Anyways. Sorry, just make it up. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll make it up on the fly. So you've probably seen him. He's been doing CE for many years. One of the best speakers out there. We've all heard from him. He's fantastic. Well, take it away. <laughs> well, <hey. laughs> all right. Hey, thank you so much. Excited to be here. Um, and it'd be part of ODs on finance. Uh, today, I'm gonna to talk about technology. And we talked already about things that we do within the optical, things that we do within our websites. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna focus on more of the medical aspect and, and introduce some of the technology that you may be familiar with, some of them you may not be familiar with, but what is in the pipeline as well when it comes to uh, providing medical eye care uh, for our patients. Uh, so here's my disclosures. I work with several different companies. And one of the things I do really appreciate about this, it helps me to hear about the various uh, uh, data, hear about the studies, practice evidence-based medicine, and to see what's coming out in the future to help move the profession forward. Because we know that uh, the way the just eye care is, is moving, a lot of it is going to be more medically based. However, you know the optical is still gonna play a huge role. So if we look at the big picture, Eye care remains strong, and so we are seeing, uh, you know, aging population. We know that when it goes to comes to growth rates uh, within ophthalmology, it's pretty much stagnant. There's no new ophthalmology residency programs being developed. But when it comes to optometry, there's about a 1.4 percent, 2 percent increase uh, each year, and so uh, there's going to be uh, opportunity for us to help address our patients' vision, but also medical eye care needs. Innovation. We continuously hear about this. Uh, you know what's uh, what's available to help improve not just the quality of vision, but the health of our patients. We know early detection is going to be key for our patients, and so I uh, definitely want to uh, uh, make sure that we are uh, uh, providing cutting edge technology to provide those services. We know that consolidation is still going to continue, and we're uh, all familiar with uh, private equity, and some may be involved with it, and some may uh, not be, but this is something that, that has been here, and so you need to decide you know, what role that you're going to take, whether to grow your own individual practice or to join one of the uh, players out there. When it comes to OD and MD collaboration, so a little bit about me is uh, I uh, just recently moved to uh, Reno, Nevada, so I work in an ophthalmology practice uh, to two ophthalmologists and three optometrists. Uh, prior to that, about eight months ago, I was at Virginia Eye Consultants, which was a tertiary referral care practice. And we had all the various uh, specialists from cornea to plastics, to retina, to glaucoma. Uh, but collaboration, that's one of the things that, you know, I've uh, pretty much uh, enjoyed the, uh, 
throughout my career is helping to bridge between both optometry and ophthalmology to help with whenever we have to transfer care or transition care to a surgeon that making sure that the optometrist is playing a role and the optometrist, if they want to do the post-operative care is, is, is playing a part there. But when it comes to technology, AI is going to uh, play a role and we're gonna hear more and more technologies that are gonna change the way that we provide medical eye care. So to be on the cutting edge of optometry, we do need to be on the cutting edge of science and technology. And so as we go through uh, these various technologies, just think about how it's gonna impact your patients, how it's gonna impact your practice. We know many of us, uh, we love to innovate. We want to be what some of the first movers, but some of us may have gotten burned on some of these technologies, but that's why we have great forums such as this, where we get to hear uh, from, from our colleagues and seeing what works. And that's why we go to the various meetings, but uh, uh, feel free throughout this presentation, put some questions in there and I'll have Dat and Aaron answer them all for me. So thanks Dat and Aaron. Some of you may have seen this, and this was just recently uh, pub actually published about a year ago. And this is looking at the National Optometry Workforce. And what they want to do, I just mentioned, is to take a look where we are now and in the future when it comes to, uh, to optometry and the profession itself. They want to take a look at the demographics for you know, male and females, as well as ethnicity. And so that, uh, we do know that there is a continued shift towards uh, more females uh, within the profession. Uh, we know that there is more limited additional capacity for the profession to expand than previ previously suggested. Uh, there was a Lewin report back in 2012 that says in the optometric practice, there's a capacity for about 20 more patients a week that we could put uh, on our schedule. But from this national workforce, what they found is there's no significant differences between men and women when it comes to hours worked. When we look at professional growth satisfaction, it was equal. If we look at productivity, it was also the same. The data did indicate there was an additional patient capacity, about two to two and a half patients per week. And so when we're thinking about, you know, is there an oversupply of optometrists? Well, we know that there are plenty of optometrists and there are plenty of patients. And with the aging population, we are going to need to move toward more uh, medical uh, eye care. Uh, there was a, a report that I saw recently looking at the projected growth from 2015 to 2025. And when it comes to uh, routine eye care, it was about 3.2%. But when it came to medical eye care, it's going to be about, about a 31% increase need of our services. And so that's where we all are going to play a role to making sure we're addressing the vision and the medical needs for our patients. And then lastly, you can see the employed versus un or self unemployed. Uh, Self-employed is up to about 44%. Uh, percent. So going to the medical, uh, medical eye care, if we take a look at age, and we know with the aging population, we know the uh, presbyopia is going to affect virtually everybody uh, that's on this web, and aren't everybody that lives. Uh, you can see that light blue line, that's going to be uh, patients with eye disease, and we know that we start to see more glaucoma, macular degeneration, and other systemic diseases uh, as we age. But then cataracts, I mean, by 2025, likely there's gonna be about 5 million cataract surgeries being performed each year. If we look at the predictability of the various reimbursement procedures, and you can see them on bottom in that middle tab, looking at cataracts, the eye exam, office visits, uh, laser procedures, and we see this is, uh, has been very stable. And so that helps us as we look at our pro projections on what you know, you know, technologies we want to bring in, and as well as looking at our patient base to see, hey, you know, are, are these technologies going to work for us, and is it going to pay itself off? And then the shift in consolidation, I just mentioned the PE, as well as uh, the growth within ophthalmology, it is uh, stagnant. You can see their medical debt is very high, uh, similar uh, to what we have within optometry. So where are we right now? The future of eye care. We're hearing more about artificial intelligence. Uh, any, anytime we're on the, the, the Facebook and we get these random ads that come up, we're like, how did they even know I was looking at something like this? Uh, but the, the way the technology is able to uh, identify some of the things that we may need within, um, may want or need uh, for our daily living. You know, some examples that Cogito, that behavioral AI. And so this is technology that is used within the, within the customer service sales teams. And what they do is it's technology that's gonna be on their computer, but as 
as the uh, as the salesperson is talking to the potential customer, they're going to get immediate feedback that you're talking too fast, like I often do, because I get excited when I talk about technology, and they'll tell you to slow down, or if you sound very boring, or you need to be more engaging. So it provides uh, automatic feedback. Uh, machine learning, uh, the online purchases, once again, the speech recognition, but also down the road when we're looking at uh, Siri and driverless cars. But as we look at the, the cataract surgery and where this comes in, here, if we could seamlessly move our data from the preoperative examination to the surgical microscope, so intraoperatively, our surgeons can see in real time exactly where to put the incisions, where to align the IOLs, uh, that's only and which IOL to use, that's only going to help our patients' outcomes. But if we take that data postoperatively and use those postoperative refractions and then put this in an algorithm, we can refine this over time. And this is just not for one surgeon, but over time within the, uh, within the data analytics for the various companies. Uh, the previous one was from Zeiss. This is from Advanced Euclidean Solutions. And so this is the self-calibrating uh, uh, biometer. And so use, getting uh, millions of eyes, the surgeons can use any IOL calculation they want, they're going to take a look at the K measurements, axial length, uh, wavefront measurements. They're going to choose their IOL. Afterwards, they're going to do a wavefront analyzer. They're going to do an autorefractor. Then postoperatively, they're going to see what those outcomes are going to be. And it's going to go back into the algorithm. And so over thousands and tens of thousands and more than that of IOLs and, and patient outcomes, this is only going to help improve the outcomes that we see for our patients. And when I talk about some of the newer IOL technology that's in the pipeline, you're going to see why this is, uh, this is happening. What about artificial intelligence and dry eye? And so this is the ophthalmic resources dry eye system. And so it starts with a tablet. And this is the blink analyzer the patient's going to have, uh, uh, have some reading material. And so it's going to measure how often the patient's blinking. And so we're going to get that blink rate. And then what you're going to do is you're going to do your examination. And when we take a look at the lids, grade from zero to four, you know, how much blepharitis does a patient have? How much injection does a patient have? What is the staining? What is the tear from breakup time? What is the osmolarity? And then as you grade that, then it's going to come into a assessment and plan to help you, uh, to help you uh, decide on what treatment uh, is going to be recommended for the patients, whether it's going to be anti-inflammatories, whether it's going to be uh, amniotic membranes, nutraceuticals, but this uh, the company also works with third-party distributors so they can send the nutraceuticals to the patient to improve compliance, improve convenience, and to make sure we are addressing our patient's condition. Uh, this is from Paul Carpecki and Doug DeVries, who are, are experts within the dry eye space. Looking at AI and glaucoma. And so this was out of uh, Europe uh, several years ago. And this was looking at uh, comparing both ophthalmologists and optometrists to the Pegasus unit. And there was about 90, 93, 94 patients in this study. And the Pegasus unit was able to detect glaucoma optic neuropathy with an accuracy of about 83%. And this is comparable to an ophthalmologist and an optometrist which were both at about 80%. And so uh, can we utilize technology to help us not just identifying the patient? This is where, you know, what, whether it's this technology, the, the one for diabetes I'm gonna show next, is how do we manage the patient? So technology we know is only gonna improve, but that's where our professional judgment comes in, not just identifying, treating and managing to make sure we're taking great care of the patients. This is the IDXDR unit, and this is artificial intelligence that is used within primary care practices. And so this is trying to detect more than mild diabetic retinopathy. And so the patient takes a photo, and if they detect that and has a sensitivity of about 87%, it has about 90% 90, 90 specificity. But if there is more than mild uh, diabetic retinopathy, and then this is going to be referred to a uh, eye care provider afterwards. And you know, when, it's, when we're looking at the various digital uh, non-mid photos, I'm not sure if you all heard, uh, but uh, LabCorp, so our patients, when they're going in for blood work, now there's actually, um, it's going to be the iris technology, the iris uh, uh, non-mid scans. They're going to be at the LabCorp, so patients are going to be getting the digital image, 
It's going to be sent to a reading center. And then uh, if they have uh, retinopathy, then that's going to be referred out to an eye care provider. But uh, it's, a, it's something that we need to know about because we want to make sure that we are a part of that management for the patient. However, we know when it comes to the photo, that's only a piece of the puzzle. It's not looking at the refraction. It's not looking at the glaucoma. It's not looking at the cataracts or the dry eye and how we monitor our patients. And I'm not sure what I just pressed. And so looking at digital health in my optometry, yes, we, there are those units that have artificial intelligence that can diagnose the retinopathy, but what about remote monitoring and how can we utilize some of the technology to help our patients manage their condition? So I don't know if you all uh, uh, signed up for 2020 Glance. And so Jackie Garlic, uh, this is, I, I saw this the other day. And so this was looking at having patients at home about three days before they went in for their eye exam to either do this app on the left, the Verona vision test, or they would do the Farsight uh, care uh, on their computer, or they had a printed chart at home to determine what was their vision. And then when they went to the, uh, the eye care provider, they wanted to see what the vision was. And these various apps were off by the Snellen in office by about one line. And so the, 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 pro the promising thing here is, this is an opportunity for us to, um, well, not uh, opportunity or just thinking down the road, how are we gonna utilize these technologies remotely for telehealth purposes to manage our patients? Actually, I started using that AMSA grid on, a, on our patients. And so just show them how to download the app and they can monitor uh, their own AMSA grid, but it'll quantify it for the patient about how much the distortion they have, and then they will send it off to the eye care provider. Looking at home monitoring, some of you may be familiar and have prescribed the uh, nodal vision um, um, uh, AMD monitoring. And so this is for intermediate AMD, and this is something that is covered by the insurance and Medicare uh, in particular. But what about down the road with home monitoring for patients that have wet AMD? And so if we can utilize, this is not FDA approved at this time, but if we can use home OCT, the patient does uh, 30 seconds per eye of, of a photo each day. But if there's changes within the intraretinal or subretinal fluid, then that's going to be sent to the, uh, the, the, the home monitoring physician. And then that's going to alert uh, the practitioner to get that patient in. And so this is going to be something else that we could add to our, our momentum. Some of you may be familiar with this, and this is the eye care home. And so we know that we catch our patient's pressure. Uh, many of us probably don't do serial tonometry uh, three, four times uh, in a clinic day, but this is an opportunity for us to identify or we send this home with the patient where they can, we can have the patient, patient take their pressures every couple hours, even throughout the night. So we can see the diurnal variations that the patient may have and those ISP spikes that we may be missing for the patient. Uh, this is something that you can go, you can either order yourself, you could lease it to the patient or rent it to the patient. Uh, there's a company out of Seattle that essentially has bought a bunch of these and they will actually uh, work with you and your patient to, to, to address this and help our patients get the technology. But then for you, there is still the, uh, there is still the interpretation and the reporting that you would bill for uh, as the eye care provider. But how does this help us? If we take a look at the relative risk of disease progression, if the patient has low uh, diurnal ILP, uh, less likely to progress versus a patient that has a diurnal ILP uh, 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 range about five or higher. And so those are patients that are more likely gonna progress. What about at-home visual fields? And that's what we're trying to think. How are we going to embrace these technologies that are already there and going to get better? And so being proactive whenever it comes to technologies, this is the at-home visual field test. It is uh, web-based, but there is also a head, uh, head unit that you could utilize. Uh, but what this does is there actually, there was a study, the patient was either doing the, the visual fields in office, either uh, uh, once a year or was done every six months. And then they had another set of patients that did the home, vi home visual field test. They did a weekly, monthly, or bi-monthly. And what they found is with the at-home testing, you can detect visual field progression or loss, which is uh, considered minus two uh, uh, decibels or more uh, in loss uh, in as early as 0.9 years. 
uh, versus if the, the patients were coming in the office either every six months or yearly, then it takes about two and a half years to, uh, to detect any progression within the visual field. And so something else that may be uh, utilized. And so those are some of the things, once again, that uh, where is the telehealth gonna come in? Where is the at-home monitoring gonna come in? Uh, right now, it remains to be seen because not everything is uh, approved at this time, but as they become available, what are we going to do to embrace this? Because we know the technology is only going to get better. Uh, some of you may have seen this, the ICL. Uh, it's been around for a while, the Vizian ICL, but they just approved it uh, uh, with my, uh, for, for patients with myopia and nearsightedness. I know many of you embrace myopia management and you all know the data very well when it comes to uh, patients with myopia and, and you know, how we can address that earlier in, uh, in, our, in our children and, and patients. But with the ICL, for patients that haven't been candidates for LASIK surgery or refractive surgery, now there is a newer version of this, which is called the EVO and the EVO Plus. As you recall, with the previous ICL technology, the patients had to come in and have a laser PI uh, within a week before the procedure uh, to make sure that the patient did not have uh, a, a IOP spike if the IOL came and closed off, uh, closed off the anterior segment or the sulcus. And so uh, what they did is you can see those little perforations within the, IO, or the ICL itself. And so the PIs are not needed anymore. Uh, but you can see it is able to correct up to 20 diopters of nearsightedness, as well as four diopters or more of a stick or less of astigmatism. And so this is just a number. We, you all know we were going to talk about presbyopia and some drops uh, as well. But uh, you can just put this within the chat box. In the U.S., presbyopia affects how many million people? 31 million, 87 million, 128 million, or 1.8 billion not million, but I will tell you, it's a lot. And there's a lot of patients that are gonna suffer from it. And if we look at it just by the numbers itself, it's 1.8 billion affected globally. If we look at it, the US, it's 128 million American presbyopes. 100% of adults are at risk of developing presbyopia as they age, but then 31 million are buying reading glasses. And so some of you may have tried the beauty. If you love it, put it in the chat box. If you don't love it, you can put it in the chat box. But whatever you all feel about it and I feel about it, it's not up to us. For us, it's all about value add. What are we going to offer our patients to say, hey, I went to my, my doctor. And I, I know the previous speaker, when they uh, for the social media, when the patient, when they tried the multifocals or the dry eye, they're going to tell other people. But my eye doctor, he offered me these, uh, these drops that I'm less dependent on my glasses. So this 31 million, 87% of those patients do not even have an eye care provider. And so we, many of you may have seen some of the commercials that have been coming out. And soon you're going to hear about a spokesperson that's coming out to talk about these drops. And in the next couple of years, you're going to see another company and then another company come out with more drops. And so this is targeting a population that we're not seeing within our practices right now. We all know how much it costs to bring in new patients and it is a significant investment. And, but now we have companies that are bringing patients to us. So if we look at the math itself, 31 million, there's about 60,000 eye care providers and not every eye care provider is gonna embrace the presbyopia drops. That's gonna leave us about 517 new patients per, per eye doctor. But so if you want it, great. So if a patient calls your office and if they ask about it, bring them in. So if they want the drops, great. But do they want glasses? Great. None of us have one pair of shoes. And so just like presbyopia, there's not going to be a one size fits all. And so it's going to be adjunct to, and patients are going to find out, we're all finding out how it's going to relate to our practices and to our patients itself. But what happens if you're not involved? What happens if a patient calls and says, hey, I heard about those drops. Uh, are you guys offering them? If you're not prepared and your staff's not prepared and says, no, we don't, we don't like those drops. Well, that patient's gonna call someone else because they're interested, they're gonna look for it, but this is our opportunity, value add for our patients. Why? Because it's all about quality of life. Uh, you know, Since I do a lot of dry eye, I think the dry eye number there is pretty low at 14%, but 60% of patients, that was the number one uh, rank condition that impacts their quality of life. Looking at the uh, presbyopia management landscape, 
Look at the percent of patients currently using over-the-counter read readers, multifocal lenses, pre prescription reading glasses. So we know many of our patients, they're using several different of these options. And so that's where these drops come in as well. It's another option for our patients. We prescribe it. If the patient finds value in it, they're going to purchase it. If they don't like it, they're not going to purchase it. Uh, and so just offering them the technologies. You know, the one call out I see on the survey, there was about 800 patients in there. You can see that contact lenses. And, you know, that, that number is pretty low. And so that's one of the things that comes to mind there is, are we offering the technologies to the patients? Mrs. Smith, have you thought about that multifocal contact lens? And so bringing our patients in because they may not realize that they're a candidate for it. And so I mentioned some of the drops, many of them are looking at pilocarpine or other cholinergics. Uh, some may be combined with uh, bromodinine. We know that Lumify works very well to get rid of redness within the eye. There are some that breaks up the disulfide bonds uh, within the lens itself. So softens those lens, uh, the lens hardening, and so allows more accommodation for our patients. And so these are several of the companies that are gonna be in the pipeline. Um, you may have seen Oracis. They they did publish or they had a press release for their phase three uh, studies near one and near two. It's actually pilocarpine 0.4%. It's twice a day. It's preservative free. Uh, and so far at, at one hour post dose one and one hour post dose two, the patients did have improvement in their near vision without affecting their distance vision. So who's a candidate? You know, many of us may be trying to wait for the right candidate for this. You know, for me, if they have presbyopia, I'm going to recommend it. I'm going to say, hey, have you heard about this? And I haven't had one patient that says no. And, uh, you know, I don't have all the, the other slides in regards to the presbyopia, but patients would be interested in trying it. Uh, there's one slide that I uh, had yesterday when I was presenting uh, in Indiana, whether they had little discretionary income or if they had plenty of discretionary income, Patients were still interested in trying it. And so once again, value add. Uh, so if the presbyopic, uh, presbyopic, I'll prescribe it. Uh, contraindications where I don't, because we don't have enough uh, data uh, available. And in the clinical studies right now, it went to about minus four. So in the high myopes, I'd be very careful. Our post LASIK, many of them, if they're my, high myopes before, aren't gonna be the ideal candidates at this time if they have a history of tears, but making sure that we're doing a good dilated exam on our patient to make sure that we are addressing and make sure they are healthy candidates for these technologies. As for retinal tears and detachments, in the literature, there's only been nine cases uh, in the literature and they were very poor case reports. When we're thinking about the concentration, it was a higher concentration. It was done at four times a day, so it's not comparing apples to apples. Also, when it comes to the presbyopia drops that are on the market right now, uh, it, is it just uh, pilocarpine, 1%? Well, the difference is gonna be in the, the, fat, the technology, the proprietary technology that uh, Allergan has, that essentially, I don't know if you've all, actually I have a drop of generic pilocarpine here that I use when I give these lectures. So if anyone ever wants it or sees me, I'll let you try it, but it does, it does sting. And so when it stings, what happens, we know we blink a lot of it out. And so not enough of the drug is getting to the target tissues to improve the meiosis. We don't know what the optimal pupil size that does occur with those, with those drops as well, generic pilocarpine. With the branded one, the proprietary technology, it, once the drop hits the eye, it helps equilibrate the, to the physiological pH uh, within a minute. And so it also does lead to the unionized form of the drug to help with penetration and to render its effect. And then the headaches have been very low. Only 0.5% of patients dropped out of the clinical studies because of headaches. And so something to offer our patients. More technology. We've had patients that had uh, corneal cross-linking. And so anytime we see a patient with ectasia, we want to offer uh, technologies and procedures that are gonna halt the progression of the disease. But what can we do for presbyopia? Well, if we can do a non-invasive way to remodel the cornea. So yes, we'll still put riboflavin on the eye every couple minutes for 30 minutes, but then if we can calculate and, and put the UVA, UVA light in specific areas and here for the mid peripheral cornea, then this is a way that we could potentially steepen the central cornea and to improve the near vision for our patients. Uh, this is on the right, this is from Jeff Machat, and this is a patient that he had. 
And by doing this treatment, and this is uh, not FDA approved once again, uh, it did increase the near vision by about 1.25 diopters. Other technologies that are on the horizon, ocular rigidity, we know as we grow up, things do start to sag. We know other things start to, to harden a little bit more, such as the lens, such as the scleral rigidity itself. And so if we can utilize uh, procedures such as uh, laser scleral microperforation, which will essentially decrease the scleral uh, stiffness, it will also uh, increase the ciliary muscle force. It'll allow the lens to change its shape and so here on this next slide, you're gonna see the procedure itself, where first the surgeon's gonna mark, uh, mark the anterior segment to identify where they're gonna do this procedures in four different quadrants onto the sclera. And this is utilizing a YAG laser to put those uh, treatments on them. Much better. So here's some of the data here. Uh, 348 eyes, 89% had distance corrected near vision 2040 or better. But by decreasing the rigidity of the sclera, it was also able to improve the function of the ciliary body and decrease the IOP by about 28%. Other things for presbyopia in the near future. So femtosecond laser with a smile. So what happens with that, le that lenticule of the cornea and, and what can be, how can, be how can it be utilized? And so we can take that wafer create a flap, and the, so here's a procedure where it's gonna be underneath a LASIK flap, but if we can put a lenticule into the stroma itself to change the shape, to steepen the cornea, this is another way that we can help improve our patient's vision. Oh, I skipped past it, but it's on there. Uh, but if we look at, here's, a, here's an early study, 20 eyes, about 95% of patients got 20, 40 or better at near. And actually, when we're talking about near, whether it's the drops, whether it's these procedures, it's not about 20, 40 anymore. It's not about J1 or J1 plus. It's about what is functional for our patients because they just want to know, can they read their phone? Can they read their tablet? Do they have to wear glasses when they're on the computer? That's what patients want to know about. What are some other procedures? If we can uh, change the index of refraction of the cornea, of the IOLs, this is a way that we could potentially change a monofocal IOL to a multifocal, or if a patient had a multifocal IOL, they can change it back to a monofocal if they weren't happy for it or happy with it. And so this is utilizing a low pulse uh, femtosecond laser, which is going to change the index of refraction. I'll let Aaron talk about Snell's law as much as he likes uh, when I'm done. Uh, but by changing that index of refraction, uh, this is a way without ablation, without cutting tissue, that we may be able to address our patient's near vision needs. And so something to be on the lookout uh, here in the, in the near future. Cataract prevention drugs. Uh, this is, uh, so the presbyopia drop, the one that breaks up the disulfide bonds, and that is uh, from Novartis. They're working on that right now. Uh, so, you know, that's going to help with presbyopia, but what's it going to do the cataract down the road? And so that might be a potential other use of that medication. But here's another one where essentially it's going to target the crystallines within the lens itself. Within the lens, there's crystalline alpha, beta, and gamma, but the alpha is what keeps the clarity of the lens itself. And so uh, utilizing uh, this drop, uh, this is what's going to help uh, improve the transparency of the cornea or of the, of the lens itself. The elegant simplicity. For the sake of time, I'm going to skip that video. But if we think about IOL technology, and so the cataract surgeon is going to do the procedure, open up the cataract, the cataracts inside of a bag, open up the bag, take out the cataract to put a clear implant in there. That, that capsule or bag is prime real estate. So yes, we could put a, we could put a, a IOL in there, which is what we do now. But on the bottom uh, right there, that's from Omega Ophthalmics. And so, yes, it's going to help stabilize the uh, capsule bag. But this is something where we may be able to put in the IOLs, of course, but perhaps drug delivery. Perhaps it can help detect biomarkers, uh, perhaps uh, uh, blood sugar, IOP. And so that's where a lot of the uh, research is right now is how can we utilize this prime real estate to help uh, improve the health of our patients? Now, some of the newer IOLs. And so this is a lens, uh, lens uh, from... Uh, um, uh, Juvie, the, the LensGen, and so this is going to be a modular IOL. 
And so first they're gonna do the capsulotomy. They're gonna take out the, 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 the lens, but then here's the base that's gonna help stabilize the whole capsular bag. And then afterwards, uh, uh, Sam Gard, one of our colleagues at a UC Irvine, he's gonna put an IOL within the bag to help improve our patient's, uh, our patient's uh, vision. Uh, this is from Alcon, this is the fluid lens. And so this is gonna have liquid silicone within the lens itself. So as a patient accommodates, it's gonna help be able to improve about uh, almost two diopters range of intermediate and near vision for our patients. Here's some of the early studies that was presented several years ago. This is not FDA approved, but something that we may have available on the horizon. This is the ACO lens. And so this is actually a sulcus lens and so it's not gonna be put within the capsular bag. But as you can see on that bottom left picture, as the patient accommodates, it's going to smooth, slide over each other. It's going to improve the, or it's going to increase the curvature of the lens to provide near vision. And uh, so one of the early, early studies here had about three diopters improvement in range of vision. This is the fine Phys IOL, uh, which uh, is an aspheric diffractive lens. Right now, the only trifocal on the market is the, is the panoptics from Alcon, but soon we may have another IOL that gives about three and a half uh, near ad for our patients. But this one's actually really cool. And this is the pinhole IOL, this is called the IC8. And some of you may be familiar with the camera inlay that was used uh, within the cornea where the, uh, with the femtosecond laser uh, pocket was created. Uh, they put an inlay in there in the non-dominant eye to improve the depth of focus for our patients. With this, it's gonna, the cataracts can be taken out, but this IOL is gonna be put within the non-dominant eye to improve distance vision, but also intermediate and near vision. And so here's a video. Um, I just wanna show you what it looks like in the eye. And so even with this, uh, you can still do your high plus lenses. You can still do BIO. It does not have any effect on any visual field testing for the patient. But ideal candidates for this patient, uh, for these implants, which is, um, um, it's FDA approved. It just hasn't been released yet. But patients with imperfect corneas, whether it's due to post-refractive, uh, post-RK, post-LASIK, keratoconus, also for astigmatism, if a patient has less than 1.5 diopters of astigmatism, they may be a candidate for this technology as well. And so be on the lookout, uh, Derek Cunningham and myself, we just wrote an article about it in the next month's uh, uh, review of optometry. Well, what about dry eye? And what are some of the newer things that we have available? And so uh, uh, this is often overlooked. And so we see a patient that we have them on the various uh, therapeutics, but if we're not looking and using our fluorescein stain or doing the lid seal test with the core blacky light test and looking to see, is there any sign of nocturnal lag ophthalmos? If we're missing that, that can affect our, our patients and, when, um, and the dryness is not gonna get better. And so that nocturnal lag ophthalmos is actually one of the root causes of the patient's issue. And so right now we know we can give them gels and ointments or we can prescribe goggles for them as well. But one of the things that I just trashed my whole lecture. Oh, there. No, I didn't. Almost that. Uh, but this is called Sleep Tight, Sleep Right. And this is from uh, DeVries and Carpecki. And so these are hypoallergenic uh, lid tape where you can put it on the eyes and it's going to help seal that light or seal that uh, uh, space. And so it's going to help address the nocturnal light ophthalmos. Uh, I've been using it for about eight months now for patients. Uh, I've, I've been able to get some patients off some of their medications because it wasn't we got the eye under control, we got the inflammation under control, but once we finally addressed the nocturnal eye ophthalmos, it did help our patient. I typically don't have them do both eyes at the same time because as you know, we grow up, we may have to get up and pee at night. And so I didn't want my patients to freak out, not see and run into things. And, uh, but this has been very successful. I'm not gonna go into the slit lamp imaging itself, but we know the value of uh, mybography for our patients. We know the value of anterior segment photos. And so here's other technologies. And this is from uh, Box Medical Solutions. This is med-based physician, where essentially it just helps with our workflow. Many of us take photos with our, with our, uh, with our, with our phones. And so this is technology that lets us track it. It's HIPAA compliant. Patients have access to it to see, are they getting better or worse, whether it's corneal staining, whether it's the mybography, whatever it may be for our patients. 
Another technology is the AOS software, where here you can take a look and it can measure uh, uh, bulbar redness. It can take a look at and count to how many uh, SPK that the patient has. If the patient has a corneal ulcer or a neurotrophic ulcer, it can highlight that area. And so as we monitor our patients and treat our patients, as it improves, we can see it improve and show it to our patients for education purposes. So what about cholerets? This is something that we often overlook. Uh, we just published a paper. It was published last week. Uh, it was called the Titan Study. And what we were doing is looking at how many patients, consecutive patients, uh, uh, so I saw 180 consecutive patients and the eight, seven other providers did as well. And what we found, we were looking to see, did the patient have presence of cholerets of two or more? And other studies, Gao did a study that says, if you find a choleret, 100% that patient does have demodex. And so what we found in this cumulative study is that 58% of patients do have cholerets and which is a, do have demodex blepharitis. And we will miss it unless we're having that patient look down where it's gonna be much more obvious where we see those cholerets. We may see some matterosis or loss of lashes for the patients, but something that the symptoms a patient's gonna have is the itching. Allergy is gonna itch in the intercanthus for the uh, blepharitis and demodex, it's gonna itch, it, itch, it's gonna itch along the eyelids itself. But look at this. And so it's twice a day. It's, it, comes in a, uh, it comes in a bottle itself, and there's preservatives in there too, uh, but the, the drug itself is called Lodolaner, and this has been used within veterinary medicine. So this is twice a day without any lid scrubs, and you can see before and after 28 days, just twice a day, the improvement that the patient did have in their Demodex blepharitis, and it doesn't matter what type of blepharitis, let's say they had staph blepharoconjunctivitis, well, the Demodex is also a vector for um, for the, the bacteria. And so this is going to help potentially with all of those patients. Here's another one. Uh, so this is from Bausch and Lom, and this is uh, Novo 3. And so this is a single molecule itself. It's not a, it's not a combination of actives and inactives uh, ingredients, but essentially what it's going to do, it's going to help get into the meibomian glands, and it's going to help, help to soften the obstructions within the glands to help improve our patient's uh, ocular surface. And so BNL, this is, uh, they just published their phase three clinical data, their second study. It's indicated for the potential indication is for the signs and symptoms of dry eye disease associated with MGD. And so it is a drop. It does have increased residence time. It is a non, or it's preservative free. It's been looked at in the literature and here are several studies, uh, early studies, uh, but here's the, the CK study. And so this was a smaller study. I think there was like 336 patients. Uh, this was a, a phase two study, but the two more recent studies that came out. So the patients had to have a tear film breakup time of less than five seconds. So we know they have some tear film instability, but they had to have a Schirmer's greater than five, than five. And so they had to be able to produce tears. And so in the Gobi trial, as well as the Mojave trial, they both had about 600 patients and they were looking at the improvement in total corneal staining, as well as the I, uh, as as well as the symptom relief. And it was found to be statistically significant in both. And so this may be another option that we have in the near future. What about the taking the dermatolo dermatological approach to treating MGD? And so this is a company. This is uh, um, I just went blank on the company. It'll come to me. Uh, but use uh, breaking up the keratin plaques. We know what happens with the MGD is there's hyperkeratinization. So if we can utilize a medication to break up the disulfide bonds, this is something that may have the potential to help address MGD. So keratolytics, essentially, that's what, that's what they're looking at using the dermatological approach here. And this is a, a potentially a twi a two treatments a week. And so you put it on the eye uh, once, maybe a Sunday, maybe you do it uh, Wednesday or Thursday down the road. And so uh, what it does, it's going to help uh, break up the mybum and as well as help stimulate lipogenesis and help stimulate lipid production. And so keratolytics, they're used within uh, chemical peels. And so many of you uh, may have had one or, or may be doing it potentially within your practice uh, if you have an aesthetic type practice, uh, but it is utilizing this approach where you can uh, break down the rate of keratinocyte production you can break up the plug, but also stimulate the, the lipid layer. 
And so here's some of the early studies and the company is, is Azura Ophthalmics. Uh, and so here's the various concentrations that they were looking at. And this is actually was just presented this past weekend or might be presented today at uh, ASCRS in Washington, DC. But looking at the statistically significant improvement in the signs, which is gonna be, be the meibomian gland score, taking a look at the symptoms at three months, 42% of patients achieved symptom free, were symptom free compared to about 15% on vehicle. And this is only two applications a week. And so this is a potential option for our patients. Here you can see uh, the side effects is eye irritation and uh, eye pain is not gonna be on there, but our patient's gonna be accepting of that when, uh, because it's still going to help their ocular surface. What about uh, basal tear production? So what percentage of basal tear production is due to inhaled air through the nasal passages? And go and you can put this within the chat box itself. 14%, 24%, 34%, or 44%. And it's going to be 34% of basal tear production is due through the inhaled air. And so why is this important? Well, if we can stimulate the trigeminal nerve or the lacrimal function, functional unit through the nose, then that's going to help increase the aqueous. It's going to improve the mucin layer, but it's also going to improve, improve the, the uh, lipid layer of the tears. And that's, that's why it's so important to find uh, a look at basal tear production. And so this is from Oyster Point. Some of you may have, a, have experience with this, where essentially it's twice a day. You take your right hand, use it in the left nostril, uh, spray it to the left ear. Patients don't snort it. You just put it gently inside and spray it, and then you do the other, other nose as well. And what it does helps improve tear production for our patients. Here in the early studies, improve the symptoms as well as the signs in this four week study, uh, and as well as the uh, ocular side effects that were zero. 82% uh, of patients in the, if you combine that study with this study, did have sneezing. Um, uh, with that, but you know, I, we've all had many patients that say, "Hey, I might sneeze, but it works," and so it has been helpful. We uh, we're in the process of writing, uh, publishing a paper right now, looking at what patient type to use it on. Do you use it on mild patients or more moderate to severe patients? And in this in this paper that we're looking at, uh, we're trying to break down the data to show that it does it does improve the symptoms in both uh, patient types. On the bottom, I like to show this video because it's like one of the grossest videos. So if you want uh, patient, uh, pay your patient's attention, and if you want them to understand why we have to treat their meibomian glands, this is the ILUX square. And so this is uh, gonna be, this should be released now. And so if you have an older ILUX unit, you can upgrade to this one, but this allows you to do biography, which is you're gonna see on top, but it also has video capabilities all within an end, you can do the procedure all in a handheld unit. And so if you don't have a, a mybographer, this is a way you can, uh, you can do or image the meibomian my glands. But then think about the patient education. Mrs. Smith, this is why first looking at the glands, this concerns me. And because you've lost over 50% of your glands, I'm gonna recommend the ILUX squared or the tear care, the third lip, uh, lipoflow, whatever, IPL, whatever you feel. Um, because we want to get you feeling better, but we want to make sure this doesn't get worse. Then afterwards, showing them the video, you're going to get definite buy-in from the patient as well on why they need to do it. Looking at the advancements in visual field technology, uh, if you have the HFA3, the liquid lens technology within that lens itself, it's going to have all the lenses in it so it can address uh, whatever the trial lens is needed for the patient. Many of you uh, may have uh, experience with the FASTER 24-C, which is not just a 54 points within the 24-2, which if we just did 24-2, sometimes we may miss the any defects within that central uh, central 10 degrees. And so uh, plotting extra points uh, within that central area to identify any early ganglion cell loss that the patient may have. And so a combination of both the 24-2 and a 10-2 for our patients. And with the CETA algorithms, uh, we know that we have the standard, which takes about seven to 10 minutes. Uh, the seat of fast is going to be about three to uh, three to seven minutes. But then the seat of faster is going to be about 30% quicker than that. I mentioned this visual field. That's just one of them. Here's another one. This is objective field. And so taking the, uh, the patient out of it on, on this, 
or a patient out of the test. So what the patient does in something like this is they just look in a device. And this is from uh, Conan Medical. And this is a seven minute test. It's looking at the pupillary responses and they do, they are, they've done studies to, to correlate that with the, uh, with the Humphrey visual field uh, printouts as well. And so this is something where seven, in seven minutes, we're gonna get printouts of both eyes. And so objective information for our patients where we don't have to worry about false positives or fixation losses or anything else the patient may have. The virtual reality. So going back to the headsets. Yes, we can do visual fields, but we can also do uh, visual acuity, color vision, contrast sensitivity, dark adaptation. So if our patient has any night vision problems, this is something that we, we can order for our patients to identify, do they have any issues that may be early signs that the patient has macular uh, degeneration. Uh, this is one device as a hero unit. Uh, I do, I've been doing uh, one of the research projects for them right now, but utilizing AI within their algorithm to plot the various points to make this make the test as efficient as possible, as short as possible for our patients. The auto workflow. So a patient comes in for routine, routine examination. We're gonna, instead of doing, some of you may be doing the FDT for the patient. Well, now you can wow them with this headset. They do the screening. If the patient misses any points within the screening, then the AI part of it's gonna switch it over to a threshold exam to help identify what's going on with the patient. And then lastly, the active trap. And so it does have a tutor throughout. And so it talks to the patient. It makes sure that the patient's tracking. And so as this light moves around, if the patient's not fixating on that light, they will not show another stimulus. And so you don't have to do any more gaze tracking. It does correlate highly with the HFA. And point, anything 0.7 or higher when we're looking at correlation is good. But here you can see 0.9 is very strong when it comes to glaucoma and other pathologies. Uh, the study we're doing now is the uh, is not the repeat, repeatability because that was done at one, one site. We're looking at the reproducibility of this test at several sites to see uh, how does it compare to the HFA. And so all the various testing strategies are available. If you hadn't had a chance to look at these, I would definitely take a look. This is the uh, All Eyes platform. And so another, uh, another device that is available, I'm going to skip the videos for sake of time. This is just their study looking at the reproducibility of, of this as well. And then, uh, um, there, and then there's a, the virtual field, the VR virtual field that I know uh, that, the, that Julie did work on a program with them as well. And their data, they have the progression analysis. So I just take a look, look at the various technologies because it is definitely a wow factor for the patients. Uh, I've had it for about four months now. And the patients are definitely wowed uh, from, the, from this technology. And so, I've actually never that narrow, I've actually never finished a technology lecture in an hour. And so I didn't think it was going to happen today. Uh, just a couple other things to comment on. Uh, punctal plug delivery systems. We have anti-inflammatories available now. Uh, there's one from Ocular Therapeutics that is actually approved for uh, allergies. Uh, that you can use for dexamethasone, but they're looking at this for glaucoma amongst other medications as well. Uh, finding different ways that we can improve. Uh, not the, or decrease the amount of wastage of the medication, but also making sure that the patient does get the medication. And this is from Inovia. And so this is just make sure that the patient, if they have a hard time getting the drop in, they horizontally put the, the spray inside their eyes. And then drug eluding contact lenses, that's something that is on the horizon as well. Mm -hmm. We know J&J &J just came out with their version with the catotophen uh, to help our patients. And the last things, this is actually the first time I ever went over there, Dad and Aaron. Uh, but a couple of things to comment on. We may have a potential treatment for dry AMD. Uh, some of you may have the uh, photobiomodulation mask that is utilized for dry eye and MGD and styes, but they're looking at this right now for uh, dry AMD. And so stimulate, we know that the retina uh, does have high uh, energy. And so if we can stimulate it with uh, near infrared light, how can we get that working better? And so uh, that's something that uh, I'll, next time I'll have more time to go into that. Uh, this is from uh, Occupire. This is a potential treatment for diabetic retinopathy and DME, and this is a pill. So twice daily oral tablet that, that may be an option for our patients instead of getting the injections or the laser. And then here for patients with, uh, uh, with geographic atrophy, there's another potential treatment that this is from, uh, uh, 
I just went blank on the company's name as well. But here, looking at the growth and measuring any changes with the geographic atrophy uh, with the with these treatments, this is a, a intravitreal injection versus without, and so they've been able to to, to help address or reduce the geo atrophy growth. And so, numerous innovations in eye care. I know there's a lot of information and. Uh, I try to get cover as much as possible, uh, but take a look at the evidence itself. You know what works for the what works for the patients. You know, what does the data say? Talk to our colleagues. You know, feel free to reach out to me anytime. But the main thing is practice at the highest level of our profession. So thank you all for uh, for attending, and I'll turn it over to you, Dat and Aaron, or Perry. All right, well, thank you so much. That was a fantastic lecture. I learned a lot. <laughs> a lot of good information there, and. After this, let's go ahead and do a quick q and I know we've got Brianna and Walt here, so feel free to leave questions in the q and I know we've got a couple we'll answer right away. And let me share my screen real quick. Walt, I have a question for you. Yes. What are, do you have, so with dry eye, right? There's so many different ways that you could go in treating it. Do you have a flow that you've come up with? So if they are X, Y, Z, you do this, this, and this. So kind of like myopia, you have all of the things that you can do. Yeah. Yeah, def that's, I definitely. That's where we all go wrong with dry eye. Are we going to start, are we, is the example for a dry eye evaluation? Or yeah. just routine? Okay. So for a dry eye evaluation, I mean, patients have already tried artificial tears. They've tried uh, three or more artificial tears over two years. And so first thing I'll do is the basics. So if they're complaining, they get a nutraceutical. So prescribe what you feel is best. They get a uh, lid hygiene. So I like hypochlorous acid. They do once a day. I prescribe a lid uh, or a heat mask. Washcloth is our, washcloth isn't enough, but then I also prescribe an anti-inflammatory. It's typically gonna be a steroid. Uh, typically, I also let our patients know to fully address the dryness, we have to treat the inflammation, but we have to treat the glands. And so I'll show them their glands itself. I will plant the seed that they are likely going to need a, a MGD procedure, but that's where I start. I'll bring them back in four to six weeks after to assess their eyes. Thanks. Awesome. And before we continue the Q&A, we do have to do a quick raffle. So I'm going to do that real quick. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And so the raffle winner, let's take a look here. And the winner is, I'm going to butcher your name. I'm sorry. Shazia Karim. Shazia Karim. I'm probably not pronouncing that right, but you have won, so email us, admin at odysonfinance.com. Claim the $100 gift card. It is a digital gift card, so you can use it anytime. All and congratulations, right. Dad and Aaron. You don't give enough credit for what you guys do to put one of these on behind the scenes. So it always <laughs> comes together so nicely. So bravo. Thank awesome. you. Awesome. It was a pleasure. So, right. And then Perfect. let's jump into these last few Q&As here. Um, beauty, of course. Big topic. It's asked about like once a week on Odies on Finance and all the other forums. Uh, <laughs> you include Beauty RX during routine. Uh, how are you charging office visits for patients who want a Beauty RX with or without a routine exam for the year? So, Walt and Brianna, if you want to take that one. Brianna, you want to take that since you're in a private yeah, practice? So, what I'm doing, um, I'm bringing it up. So, if they're a candidate for it, I want them to always hear about new technology from me and not a commercial. So if they fit into that where they're using readers or where I found it, the sweet spot too, or like those plus 75 hype ropes where they're 2040 and you throw over that plus 75 or plus one, you're like, oh my God, this is amazing. And then you're like, well, okay, but I prescribed this for you. You're like, I'm never going to wear these glasses. So what I found is there's a big gap right there too, that we can fulfill with this drop to help them not only for far away, but also for reading. And then if they call about the drop, then yeah, we are bringing them in just for a quick evaluation, making sure that they don't have any dryness and then we can go forward with it. Yeah. And if you're interested on the billing aspect, if you if you go to AOA.org, I serve on the AOA coding committee. And so we just uh, uh, wrote a, a statement on that, on, on how to bill. Uh, it doesn't matter what the patient, whatever patients come in, it's a reason for the visit. It's medical in nature, it's going to medical uh, uh, medical insurance, but if not, it's either going to a vision care plan or it's cash pay. Uh, some people do have a presbyopia evaluation, kind of like a LASIK consultation and charge for those services. And they, whatever the cost is, whenever they bring the patient back, uh, whether they bring them in the office or do telehealth to follow up with them in a few weeks, then that's all built in and bundled together. All right, awesome. And... <laughs> 
don't know if this was a question more of a comment can you make the dry eye products you mentioned please <laughs> and then um some on a similar note what was the demodex med called that uh, walt mentioned so that was lotolaner and it's tpo3 is from uh, Tarsus uh, Pharmaceuticals. And so you, if you just Google Tarsus and go to their website, they have a lot of different information on it. And I've got a question for both Walt and Brianna, since you both are at the forefront of kind of the future of our profession and the innovation. What do you think is going to be the one big thing that we're going to see in the next five to 10 years that's going to start to take market space in our profession? It's going to really start to disrupt in a good way in our profession. What do you think it is? It's a tough question. I that, think, that, is, that is a tough question. I think as more PE is coming in and we're all seeing how they're flipping these practices and putting processes in place, I think if we continue to innovate in that area where it's meeting the patients where they want to be met, we all see a ton of patients, but we're not meeting them where they are. So I see if all of us can get on board with some of the things that were presented today, not only on the medical side, because it's interesting to see when we do these talks, the engagement on the medical side for Walt's lecture versus the engagement on the side for her beers and mine. I think we're still so medical focused that we have to switch this a little bit. Mm -hmm. So I want us to take charge of the, it's a huge data play. That's the future. The future is data. All these companies want it. And I want us to use it the way they are. That's the play. Yeah, yeah. And for, for, for me, it's, it's going to be, you know, with all this technology uh, is, is where are we going to fit in and being proactive uh, on, on the medical side. That's in regards to, you know, the lab core doing the, the photos there now and billing for those or the primary care doctor offices. Many of them already have the non-mid cameras in there. And so how are we gonna be a player within the healthcare system? Uh, I've been going and talking with various uh, uh, medical directors with uh, health systems and, and just saying, hey, you know, eye care needs to be involved with this, uh, but finding ways for us to implement this technology and, and being innovative in, in how we go about engaging with the patient as Brianna just mentioned, but making sure that you know, we don't just put our head in the sand because the technology is only going to get better. We have to find ways to adapt. Dad, yeah. what do you see? Yeah, you know, just to kind of chime in because, you know, as you guys come in, I work on site as an Apple chom chomptress, right? There's a reason why Apple has a medical group, you know, spend like millions of dollars for our own departments up to. So obviously I don't know what they're working on, but I think the most exciting is going to be Apple Glass for sure, you know? So I think in the next, you know, three, five years, um, Apple put a lot of money in our championship department. We are involved in binocular vision a lot. And also surprisingly, diabetic and hypertensive rat. So I, I don't know what they're doing, but they're doing something in telehealth and AI for sure. So I think the biggest thing is gonna be binocular, binocular vision. Um, color vision is a surprisingly big thing as well too. Think about Apple Glass, right? That's going to really change most of the consumer color deficiency as well too. Contrast sensitivity, liquid lens technology, all that stuff that we all kind of talk about, you know. So I think that's going to be a huge game changer in the next three or five years for consumer as aspect. And Trump's going to be very involved in that. So, yeah. Aaron, what about you? Yeah. That, that is a good question. And I think there's so much that's going to, I love virtual reality and I've talked to Dad a lot about this. And I think that that is going to play a major factor. Uh, it's not there yet, but it's going to be there. And I think it's going to take. A few more years before we're going to see a refraction in a virtual headset and that's going to be just the standard and that's going to cut down on footprints i mean you can have an you could have a whole practice in 20 square feet with something like that and that could completely change how we practice optometry so that's what i see and i, I add to that too because yeah. i Go think ahead. that what's also interesting is apple's getting into this background of all of this is Patients want access to their medical records and it has to be easy. So we all have the device. Why is nothing living on this as our going from here to here to here? So like having a QR code when you check in, that's all of this data. So I think there's going to be this universal potential healthcare record that lives there because it's healthcare right now is so it's not cohesive. Yeah, I see a push for that. Uh, where Dat and I practice in the Bay Area, we have Sutter Health, which is the big hospital setting here, and they have an app where you can actually access all your healthcare records on an app and show them to your doctor. 
I think the big thing is that they don't want to share with like, you know, a Kaiser, or, uh, you know, a competitor. And so that's where we're going to see the big disconnect is, is kind of how do we breach that? And I, I bet there's going to be a company that comes out Actually, that enables a, a universal platform, or a, you know, an agnostic platform for that. So it, yeah, so that'll be pretty cool to see. Good point. Uh, basically, Apple, almost everyone has some kind of eye for it, right? So Apple is actually working on this, um, almost an app almost. If you look at your Apple phone right now, it actually can automatically connect to your Southern Health, Kaiser, and also every single database out there now, you know? So I think in the next five, six years, like you can literally lock onto your, I, your iPhone, access to your health record. It has your class prescription there, has your medication there, you know? So it's actually gonna be really more cohesive, you know? So, yeah. yeah. Awesome. I think too, like yeah. that push, like we all talk about having a website presence, right? It's moved way beyond that. So I think all of us thinking that somebody's gonna remember westbroadeyecare.com at 9.30 at night, they're not. Right. So all of this is we know when the patients do, we know when they ordered a six month supply, we know when their their glasses or, or any of that. Right. So it's all got to be these push notifications where they can take action and literally Amazon order. So I think as Amazon is also getting into this remind, like, remember, you're the ones that the patients trust. So, yeah, we're going to see innovation, but we can't cut out this doctor patient relationship, but we have to be at the center of that in innovation. And we, all of us on this, moving it forward, we know that that's critical or all of industry loses and the patients at the end of the day lose. So we have to do this dance with technology and healthcare, but we all get to be a part of it. So it's, it's taking action tomorrow, setting up all these demos right here, right? Just pick one. Yeah. And that actually brings me to the last question I want to ask our two panelists that are remaining, and then we'll wrap it up here. If you had to choose one thing, and remember this is Odie's on finance, so we're trying to be profitable. One thing that can make your practice more profitable, it can be something simple or something large. What would you tell the audience is that one thing? And there's no right or wrong answer, just off the top of your head. Yeah, go ahead, Walt. Find a, pa find a passion. I mean, you hear from many of us of, you know, whether you love myopia management, if you want to go into aesthetics, you know, for me, I do dry eye. And that's how I, I built my practice. I mean, I've, I've never had an optical. I've always worked with an ophthalmology. And so there's nothing I'm selling. And so for me to be productive, I have to uh, look at, uh, you know, what are some of the other ways that I can go and practice and with cash-based services and procedures itself. I mean, there's, was it, 44 million Americans suffer from uh, symptoms of dry eye. And, you know, many of us, if we're not looking for the dryness, if we're not asking the questions, we're gonna, meet, we're gonna miss it. And so that's been the biggest uh, uh, game changer within my career is embracing that. And I've done that in Nevada, I've done it in Virginia, uh, but in the end, it's a patient that benefits from it. And it's an opportunity because not all of our colleagues uh, want to embrace dry eye. And so it's an opportunity to co-manage and collaborate with them and say, hey, I'm happy to do IPL on your patients. And then I'll just send them back for all the follow-up care. Mine that I've implemented so far, obviously with my opto map was down, I was like, oh my God, this thing just like prints money. And when I added it up over the three weeks I was down, it was unbelievable. So that's been one. And then obviously I'm biased here, but Dr. Contact Lens, just low hanging revenue that all of us have um, and actually understanding the data that all of us have sitting right there. So it's these integrations with these EMRs that is absolutely critical. Fantastic. All right. Well, thank you all for staying on and thank you for fantastic lectures. Uh, Brianna, thanks for starting it out. Oh, to Javier, awesome. I know he had to sign off. Thank you to him. And then thank you to Walt for a great lecture to finish it off. And I also want to thank all our sponsors that are listed right here. So our diamond sponsor, Optify, once again, fantastic resource for bringing optical into your office, putting it on your website. Our platinum sponsors, Bill Gerber and OMG, making that just standout optical for everyone. 1284, bringing in the new frame lines that you can sell. And then Hero, of course, with the virtual reality headset. And Entrepreneur, starting a conversation on how to implement all these different technologies and innovations in your practice. So thank you everyone for signing on. I know it is approaching 1230 West Coast time and 330 East Coast time. So we're going to let you all go. There will be a recording of this being posted probably in the next few days. But once again, thank you everyone and have a great Sunday. We're going to sign off here. All right. Take care, guys.